Simpsons Index, an online spreadsheet that is also a podcast. This is the podcast. Coming to you out of SideQuest Studios, this is the Simpsons Index, episode 214. Hello out there, I'm your host, Elliot J. O'Neill, and joining me here as always, except when he's not his BT Calloway. Ahoy, hoy. And joining us once again from Ohio in the United States is The Real Jims. Hey, hey, everybody. Glad to be back on your show. Uh, thanks for coming back, dude. And of course, this is The Simpsons Index, the podcast where we watch and review three episodes of The Simpsons at a time, but there is a twist. Each episode must come from a different decade. And yeah, yeah, like I said, thank you very much for coming back onto the podcast. Um, yeah, we had a great time last time you were on, mm-hmm. all the way back in the 170s, I believe. Oh, wow. Really? That, <laughs> that long? Yeah. That feels so, that seems so long ago. Yeah, that's it. I've stopped measuring time in the conventional yeah. years and just in episodes of this <laughs> podcast. Mm. Oh, I remember it like was it, like it was back in 111. <laughs> So yeah, for those that don't know, yeah, The Real Jim's making lots of uh, great Simpsons YouTube videos and uh, yeah, recently did a deep dive into Simpsons Christmas episodes. Dude, that was Ooh. epic. Uh, thank you. There are so many Simpsons Christmas episodes. Kind of crazy to think that you can like review over 20 of them by now. Like, Whoa, Jesus. Especially given that only five are good. Yeah, like when I started that project, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I think it mm. ended up being my longest video ever at like 29 minutes or something. It was ridiculous. Yeah, well, recently we reviewed Miracle on Evergreen Terrace and like then we were like, oh, yeah, there's like five or six of the things. But I forgot like how many Christmas mm-hmm. is like kind of incidental in the episode. Yeah, Miracle on Evergreen Terrace, that was definitely a fun one to review because I ended up ranking it at number 12 out of 20, mm. which was a yeah. ranking that that absolutely nobody was satisfied with because there were a lot of like <laughs> there was a lot of fans of season nine who was like you know it's it's close to the classic era you should be putting it in the top three to top five but then there are mm-hmm. other people who absolutely hate that episode and think it's the absolute worst so putting yeah. it at number 12 like no good for anybody no i mean i think it's one that surprised us as well we ended up giving it a dull silver and yeah it was just surprisingly flat as an episode Yeah, but then you sent out that, uh, you know, review thing on Twitter where it was like, do we get it wrong? Did we get it right? Would you rank it higher, lower? And I think most people, like, majority were on, you should have ranked it higher. Uh, Most people agreed with me and Diana, but, like, only just. Yeah. Hmm. So today uh, we're not reviewing a Christmas episode because you've definitely had enough of that lately. Oh, yeah. Thank God. (laughs) So, yeah, today... It's time for the Easter episodes, damn it. (laughs) I wonder how many of them there are. Probably... Probably not many. Yeah. I remember there is one with an Easter egg hunt where Homer starts beating up babies to defend Maggie. Anyway, we didn't watch a holiday episode at all, except a vacation episode, a kind of a holiday. Uh, We just watched Season 31, Episode 7, Live and La Pura Vida. First released in November of 2019, it was directed by Timothy Bailey, written by Brian Kelly. In this episode, the Simpsons get invited on the Van Houten's group family vacation trip with the Hibberts, Mm -hmm. the Chalmers, and also Patty and her new girlfriend, who Homer gets along with. And Lisa's worried about the cost, and Marge is worried about getting the perfect picture, and lots of other things happen. Hey, y'all, what do we think? It's okay. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised by it, even though it's a vacation episode, which I usually hate. Uh, mm-hmm. I thought this one was pretty solid, actually. I spent a lot of time wondering how they were going to fuck it up, and then they didn't. So I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Mm. I think the fuck up could have been more fucked up, but honestly, mm. I quite liked this episode. This was a fun journey for me. I, yeah. I too, was pleasantly surprised. I was impressed that, like, this was a vacation episode that seemed to avoid a lot of those vacation pratfalls where they're kind of going through the motion of just seeing one, like, tourist attraction after another. Like, this one actually Mm, felt like an actual episode of The Simpsons with characters and actual conflicts instead of just a tourist trip. No, Mm -hmm. it was an episode of The Simpsons that happened to have the Costa Rica backdrop. And the detail that, like, Kirk was, like, putting on his very limited Spanish, like... Oh, yeah, I that thought was, was beautiful. <laughs> it's, or it's, just assuming he could like drink the local water and stuff like that. As much as I didn't like how they did that, the the guy who's like, "Oh, look, I've been here ever, every year since I was five. I know, how, I know how to do this. I'm basically a native." Like, dude, dude, stop. Yeah, <laughs> we ended up getting a very like confident Kirk. You know, like at the beginning, we're like, "Who mm. is this?" Which like... is rare. 
yeah, like, like who is this version of Kirk who, like, no, it was like handing out drinks, and like most shockingly, people actually seem to like him. Like the mm. whole beginning of the episode is just kind of a trip in general. Yeah. Oh, just a uh, big props for his confidence there. It goes a long way, and uh, mm. then it all comes unraveling. But we'll get into that first of all. Let's go through the questionnaire. And Jim, we'll start with you. For better or worse, what's a moment from this episode that stands out to you? I guess I'm going to say that the first thing that stood out for me was how much Shauna was in this episode. Like, mm-hmm. I remember that she was in it and that the Chalmers played a role, but she was, like, kind of all the way through with this whole cell phone thing from the beginning at the airport all the way. Like, she kind of closes out the episode, too. Like, this has got to be one of the most Shauna-heavy episodes aside from her, like, the her first appearance episode, I think. Mm-hmm. Shauna and Chalmers as well, because... It was only sort of made in passing reference that she was his daughter in one episode. And yeah, I think this is the first time we've sort of seen them interact a lot. And yeah, it is a lot. Yeah, we get a little bit more hint of uh, Chalmers' tragic backstory of losing his wife somehow, which we got in, uh, mm. was it Wake Up and Smell the Roosevelt's, I think, where they mentioned, you know, his, his lost wife. Yeah, which ironically, that was the other Simpsons Index episode that I was on. That was the first one that I talked to you guys about. So, like, clearly I'm just, like, the Chalmers backstory guy that you call up whenever you need it. Yep. Have you done a a Chalmers history one yet, or? No, I haven't. That's one that is definitely going to happen eventually, because he's an interesting guy. That backstory stuff and how he's evolved, like, he's definitely getting one, but, but not yet. Oh, yeah. All yeah. right. Well, yeah. Everything you've ever wanted to know about Superintendent Chalmers, but we're too afraid to ask. <laughs> <laughs> but because this is one of the things I was worried about with this episode, with so many characters, you know, it's hard to give mm. them all proper service and also the stories that they're carrying proper service. But to me, there is something really funny about having every one of the axe stings be like this really incidental Shauna Jimbo mm. communicating thing with... and. Especially sold the silliness of it with the monkeys reacting. Yeah. Oh, he proposed. <laughs> that got yeah. a laugh out of me every time. Mm. Gotta love the monkeys. Mm. BT, what stands out to you from this episode for better or worse? I mean, you know the monkeys don't play their own instruments or write their own songs, right? <laughs> That's not even Michael Nesbitt's real hat. Anyway, uh, what really, I mean, we're going to stick with Chalmers because what really stood out to me is the fact that Chalmers didn't go at this resort, I'm a winner, yep. or I've lost so much weight, I'm thinner. None of that. I kept waiting for it, and it didn't happen, and I'm so happy. <laughs> Thanks to them for showing some restraint. I know, and it was right there, and they didn't pick it up. They kept it very serious. Uh, I was genuinely impressed, so way to not fuck that up. Again, I kept waiting for something to go horribly wrong, like some racist portrayal of uh, Costa Rican people or something, or... You know, random celebrity. What are you doing in Costa Rica? I don't know, but it never happened. So yeah, it's, it's a, I'm, I was not disappointed. Well, on the sort of catchphrase humor that kind of irks us a bunch, you know, even Shauna, like I liked her. I'm Shauna bit where yeah, the people are like, I'm stunned, I'm shocked, I'm Shauna. Yep. To me, that's like the very few times that joke worked for me. I think I think they wrote that whole sequence just so they could do that Shauna joke. Oh, yeah. Come on, oh, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, what stands out to me, I gotta say, I fucking loved Evelyn and Homer in this episode. This was yeah. just such... Uh, I don't know. I, I think it was a really smart move for this episode, and I thought they built it up really well. Yeah. Do you think that's kind of... Because I I agree, I really like that observation, because especially with how much Patty and Homer especially hate each other. But do you think that mm. there's something a little too sitcom-y about the premise of, you know, that Evelyn is a Homer? It is kind of one of those classic, maybe not full yeah. house level sitcom but it is one of those kind of like classic sitcom setups. I for sure. Don't you realize this person's that person you've hated all along? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it does come into, I mean, what's going to be my big criticism of the episode is that I don't think they quite stick the landing, and Mm. in that way as well, that they made it a little too obvious and hammered it at home a little too hard, just sort of while they were building it up and it was just part of the story and they didn't point it out was, yeah, where I was having the most fun with it, and even that they bonded over something as simple as... I don't know, this is a thing, cornhole. <laughs> I mean, that seems to be the term. I was would have assumed that meant something else, but uh, let's not go there. Wait, wait a minute, they, they, they don't have cornhole out in Australia? Come on, it's a great American Midwest classic. <laughs> yeah, here, here we just call it Chazwaza. Yeah, <laughs> and, and we're throwing uh, cane toads into, yep. um, what do we Mulchers. have? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, but that it built up from something as silly as that and mm. that it got it wasn't just all fun as well. It got into their more destructive side as well. Like yep. and I thought it made the perfect break for like Marge in the episode as well, with yeah, Evelyn like I really loved that sequence of her diving off the thing, splashing and then the fish eating the phone and the, it mm. that all worked for me. Yeah, especially because, you know, Homer does desperately dive in and try and get the, catch the fish that has the phone. Yeah. And then the fact that it does come to a head with Patty being all like, oh, your Homer ruined everything. And it's like, no, no, you don't get it. Evelyn has affected Homer this time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, Marge using her full name as well, which apparently is Patricia <laughs> Maleficent Bouvier. There we go. <laughs> it's especially nice since, um, like, these whole Marge and Homer conflict episodes are just so repetitive by now. So at least mm. having Patty here to kind of make not really a yeah. triangle, like a square, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Like, but that actually like did create a fresh angle for this kind of tired storyline. Yeah. And it kind of just creates a new dynamic and that is all you need surprisingly to really make it not the most tiring thing in the world. Well, I think the choice of the characters that they decided to include on this vacation did make for some new ideas mm. and fresh things. You know, we rarely see Patty Selma one without the other. So yeah. that was good. And then, yes, like we said before, Chalmers and Sean are together. Like, what are they actually like together? And, you know, it, it wasn't much, but having the Hibbets and their kids. And, mm. man, there was something cute about, like, Millhouse trying to impress the older yeah. kid. Because uh, it, it just says a lot to backstory where he walks up and says, hey, do you still like Legos? As in... This kid's like just old, a little bit old enough to now be like a full blown teenager, whereas Millhouse is still, you know, 10. Yeah. And um, probably played Legos with him in the past. And yeah. Yeah. And so it's just, it's just enough backstory to get you kind of understand that relationship and where it is. And it's in a single line of dialogue. So well done, Simpsons. Mm. Yeah, they need to do more with the Hibbert kids, to be honest. Like, it's always been mm. kind of weird that he's had all these kids for so long, and they've never really done anything with him. So, like, it yeah. was a very small amount, and it didn't affect the story, but I like that they threw it in. It was very vacation-y. Yeah, mm. actually, and last time we saw Hibbert's kids was in Miracle on Evergreen Terrace, so uh, they were riding around on ski doos, I believe. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, this is a very packed episode, because there's not even an intro, it's just The Simpsons, and you're straight in. So. Straight in. So, uh, wackiness. How were the wacky elements in this episode? How did they balance the cartoony moments? Uh, an early wacky part that I really liked is Marge just driving home as fast as possible and then just going past the wind chime store. All the wind chimes go off and then they catch fire. I was like, okay, that got me. I wasn't expecting that. And launching Ralph with a kite was, uh, it's not as good, but you know, the wind chime bit got me. And the fact it gets a reprise later, it's like, well, Lou and his girlfriend were going to come, but then a billboard fell on him and her ch wind chime store caught on fire. I actually popped for that. <laughs> that was a yeah, really that's an episode with a memory. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, th that sequence is so good. And I like how at the end, they also even remember that Bart was in the car and he gets out and kind of throws up on the yeah. lawn. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of puking in this episode, too. Yeah. Yeah, cartoony moments as well. Yeah, we mentioned the monkeys before. Like, I kind of wish there was a little bit more fallout from the whole Evelyn and Homer monkey party thing. Or, mm. oh, man, I just wish I saw more of it because that looked like they had a <laughs> freaking fun day. Yeah, there are a few parts oh, yeah. that don't fully feel like they come together. Like, you know, we've seen Marge get obsessed with status and being seen as a big deal before with uh, uh, whatever that one is when they're trying to get into the country club. Yeah, uh, yeah. But that, and that's kind of hinted at here with really wanting to get that perfect photo. It doesn't quite get as in, in deep as into it as I would have wanted. But uh, yeah, it's still there. Honestly, with an episode with so many monkeys running around, I think it probably <laughs> should have been wackier than it ended up being. Because other than that, like, what is there really? Like them like throwing the bra thing up in the window or maybe like throwing yeah. Bart up there later? <laughs> There's not really a ton of wacky stuff in this one. No. Nah. Man, I did laugh when Homer just launched Bart in there. That, yeah. Again, it's such a good testament to when the show is good, when it has memory, just, yeah. that's just like, the line and hook is too quick, just throw the kid up there right now. Oh, yeah, for sure, it's efficient. Um, my only real other note of wacky might be a bit of a, uh, Claire's Did You Ever Notice This Corner, mm -hmm. in which they find like the, um, you know, the Costa Rican stone spheres, and they're like, oh, you're not allowed to take these off the island, they end up being salt and pepper shakers. How the hell do you mistake a salt and pepper shaker for an actual stone sphere? Like... They won't feel the same. They won't have the same weight. Uh, Lisa's not that stupid. That will move you authentic. It's just a bit weird. Yeah. Kirk went all out for those. 
Yeah. I guess. Got proper stone salt and pepper shakers. They'd make pretty terrible salt and pepper shakers, though. They would. It'd be very hard to hold and shake. And, like, because the salt and pepper is, like, facing each other inside yeah. the thing, they'd probably get mixed up a little. Like, y- Yeah, wait a minute. Wait a minute. How does, the, how does the one on top, yeah, how does all the salt not end up in the pepper one when you put them together? <laughs> yeah, see, it seems like a thoughtful gift, but it's garbage. <laughs> oh, thanks, Kirk. Trash. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, my only other note of whack was the zipline sequence at the end, which, I mean, did this Simpsons, especially HD era, you know, 16.9 thing of mm-hmm. having story going on in the foreground yeah. that's essentially just functional while more interesting stuff is happening in the background, which, I don't know, I thought was fine. It's definitely been more egregious in the past. Yeah, I mean, they didn't have to because this is, you know, the uh, emotional core of your episode and this is the conclusion of that. You don't need to distract us with silly jokes in the background. But yeah, Kirk leaves on the zipline first, and then somehow everyone manages to catch up and even surpass him. And mm. uh, that's not how physics works. Yeah. yeah, you can tell that they were pretty desperate for a third act kind of... I don't know mm. if you can even call it an action sequence. Maybe they just didn't want to run through the jungle or something. Or they're like, I guess they're ziplining in Costa Rica. <laughs> and mm. like, I agree, it falls like a little flat because, you know, it's a one-way system. You can't really do anything yeah, about it. Yeah. It's not a chase scene. It's not a chase scene. Nah. <laughs> Which I guess is kind of the comedy of it, but yeah, it, it could have been something else. But um, have either of you ever been ziplining? No, yeah, never. I think so. I think I've been on something a long time ago. But in fact, I can't quite remember, so a lot. Yeah, I don't know. It seems very fun. I know South Park uh, yeah. <laughs> really ripped hard into it, and that's still probably like my most recent favorite episode of theirs. I think the yeah. show's gone down the tubes. But yeah, yeah, their ziplining episode was fucking fantastic. Yeah, what about the heart of this episode? How were the emotional moments? You know, for a story all about relationships and emotion, I did not write down any notes of heart. So maybe that's on me. Maybe I'm just a robot. You sure are. Beep. Yeah, I don't. I, I agree. There wasn't really a lot in terms of emotion. I think they kind of get a little bit at the end where Marge tells her that Evelyn isn't just a homer because obviously Evelyn loves her. And I think that was a nice little moment. But I do think that they don't really like do enough with Patty and Evelyn's relationship. Like it's not on screen enough for it to like really hit hard in the end. I don't think. Yeah, that's right. I don't think we got a single scene of them in Costa Rica together. Like they were often um, other than maybe a group scene or two. Yeah. Uh, It was was really just that establishing thing. And I forgot to mention before when we're talking about it. Yeah. Fortune Femster was the guest star as Evelyn. She's an amazing stand-up comedian. And yeah, I thought, she did amazing voice work what, for this character. What was her name? Fortune Femster. Or Femster. I'm not... Yeah. That that sounds so made up. Mm. She's got a show with another comedian, Tom Popper, at the moment as well. And it's like something with Popper and Fortune. And it's like... Yeah, that <laughs> sounds like an Instagram account that follows the world's most, we- most wealthy women. Mm. And uh, <laughs> I don't believe it's a real name. And I think you're lying to me. <laughs> I don't think it is her real name. Very few people in Hollywood use their real names. <laughs> Well, whoever she is, she did a good job, I think. Like, her southern accent... Yeah, oh, absolutely. Like, I really did enjoy her southern accent. It brought a little bit of extra flavor to the character, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, what did we think about the whole Homer fantasizing about all of her metaphors and things? I, I genuinely enjoyed it. I think it really just showed how her little colloquialisms sparked into Homer's imagination. We've gone to there so many times to see him kind of enjoying the images was... Uh, yeah, it worked. I was, I was quite surprised. That said, if someone found it annoying, I could certainly understand it, but no, nah, I thought it was endearing. I wrote I wrote in my notes that, it, like, is this too much, like, thought bubbles? Because they really did, how many did they do? Like, five or six total? Like, after the mm. third or fourth? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, I was like, maybe this is a little much, but they did actually win me over in the end when, like, Homer started doing it, and they had that last one that was sweet, so it came back Yeah, around. with Marge going, yeah, comfy as a bug in a rug, and he's like, oh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think the real key to it was they didn't overstay the welcome. She just said the thing, he pictured the flip-flop alone on the beach, and that was it. It wasn't the flip-flop then realized it had lost its family and began to cry or anything like that. It just stuck with what the little colloquialism was, and that was enough. Yeah, it wasn't like those thought bubble gags where then it ends up being like Jesus driving a tank into Flanders' house or something. Yeah, <laughs> nothing like that. It was just <laughs> the thing that it was. Uh, I think one of the emotional moments that stood out to me, and again, really good memory of this episode, is Lisa's whole twirling of her hair thing about the anxiety Mm. about the money. And, you know, cartoon wackiness as well. I really wish there was more of her, like, 
seeing the food and drinks as money and just how much mm. of it is being going to wait. Like, yeah, they only do that for one scene. Yeah, um, but yeah, her anxiety about that and the hair twirling and then mm. that it's affecting the whole family later and they're all doing their hair twirling and then yep. that one little spike is just a bit frazzled. Like, I thought yep. that really sold uh, her emotions for this episode for me at least, yeah. I gotta say, that was definitely the most relatable part of the episode to me, because I don't know if you two yeah. are similar, but, like, I actually do twirl my hair a little when I'm anxious or nervous. Like, if I'm watching a sports match, which is really close, mm -hmm. like, I'll do that to my hair. Mm -hmm. Or, like, if I'm playing a board game and I'm, like, nervous about a move, I will totally start doing yeah. that. It's a huge yeah. tell. Like, if you play poker with me, like, <laughs> I'm definitely nervous. So, but, yeah, like, like the fact that, like, I think the whole family was twirling their hair by mm. at one scene. Yeah, which, in the end, works because Homer doesn't have any, but they don't yeah. stop and point at it and say, oh, Homer's doing it too. Yeah. It's just there. But no, I'm very much the same. I, yeah, play with my beard all the time. And yeah, especially like, yeah, when things are getting tense, I'm pulling at it. Yeah. What about the emotion of like where it all comes crashing down at the end? Oh, you mean they reveal that the Van Altons are in the resort or something? Yeah. Except that they don't because their family does, but some of the I don't... It's like a family timeshare business. A little bit slapped together. I was just like... It's not entirely free, like, you still have to pay for, you know, the food and the bartending service and all the rest. It's just, it's still a resort. Zip lining ain't free. Mm. I don't know. It was enough, but it wasn't, it didn't exactly and totally make sense to me. Yeah, like, I don't know, like, it kind of felt like the emotional low of the episode was, like, the whole salt shaker reveal thing. By the time they got to the, like, real reveal of Kirk Van mm -hmm. Houten, like, I don't feel like people got necessarily mad enough. Like, they all kind of confronted him, and then they just zip lined away, but I don't know. I feel yep. like that moment should have hit a little harder, I think. And also, who the hell pays with a check? No one does that. Not these days. <laughs> no. So, oh, he can't endorse those checks. Like, um, you would have just transferred, but okay. <laughs> but yeah, I thought similar to that, like, I just thought the reveal of the stones, like, wasn't enough to get the Simpsons offside with the Van Houtens as well. Like, yeah, I guess the kids busted into his room and found something, but, like... That wasn't the point. No one said, you broke into our room. Oh, my gosh. But also, it wasn't on Marge and Homer that that happened, either. Like... Well, you, you could do that with, oh, I should not never have brought your family. You're a bunch of troublemakers. Blah, 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 blah. They could yeah. have done that. They didn't. It did feel weird that they ended up doing two trips to Kirk's room. Like, it was just kind of weird how you go up there yeah. once, and, like, you reveal a little part, and then you end up having them go back again to do the real reveal. Like, I kind of wish that they somehow, like, merged it and maybe just did one trip to sneak into their bedroom and maybe, like, figure out, like, the conflict point in some other way. Yeah. Yeah, they see the painting up on the wall and then later on figure out, oh, wait, that's this guy and that means this. Yeah, but, uh, which is a shame because I think, like, the economics of this story, like, it, it is very fluid and stuff. It's just the big conflict at the end, yeah, just really didn't come together as well as the build-up for the rest of the episode ago. But ultimately, did it feel like an episode of The Simpsons? So these are characters we know and love. Is this the show we know and love? I guess the biggest integrity break would be confident Kirk, but I like that it's, you know, framed within here he's a confident guy because he's, you know, been here so many times and they have a degree of power. And then, of course, that all comes crumbling down at the end where he's all, you know, Lou Anne's like, oh, I had no idea. And he's like, no, you told me to charge more. So, you know, mm. that gets undermined. Um, yeah, Lisa's stressing about things. That makes sense. I'd, I'd say it's pretty integrity is pretty good. I think the Lisa part was probably the part where they lost me just a little bit because okay. I think they did a good job of cluing everybody in at the beginning, telling like, like, you know, Bart, you can use a machete and Lisa, there's like biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Like they did really sold their excitement for everybody. But I, I do think Lisa did get a little too obsessive about the money overall. Like her whole storyline became about the money. And I get that Lisa is basically a little adult, but mm -hmm. it did seem a little like, you know what I mean? Like we all complain about when Lisa's just like two issues oriented all the time. And I do feel like if she would have just enjoyed the vacation, we all would have believed that characterization completely. Like if Lisa just was enjoying her time there. So Lisa being so like dead set on the financial issue, I thought was a little bit of a weird decision for her. Yeah, well, I mean, she, yeah, starts freaking out and um, practicing lying on the seat to the back of the car when they have to move into the car and the car is cloth yeah. and yet somehow it's sticky. I did I did like that line. The whole paranoia was a bit much, but the line, somehow the seats are sticky despite being cloth, that was all right. How did you guys feel about Marge in this episode with how obsessed she was about the social angle and the social media picture mm. stuff? I mean, Marge has that degree to her. They just needed to build into it a little bit more because... 
you know, it's happened for occasionally that she does care that people see her family as being, you know, a good family. And so a picture, I could understand how they get there. They didn't quite earn it, I don't think. And then it didn't quite build as well as it could have. Again, I kind of refer to um, Tales from a Class Struggle in Springfield, I think is that's the, yeah. the country club one. Because uh, that does it really, really well. But this doesn't, because it's not the focus, it doesn't build on it as much as it could or should. Yeah, and of course, naturally, yeah, it's weird. Simpsons are using modern social media. Whatever, this is the era that we're watching them in. And, and yet still use checks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, I was going to point out with Lisa before, she's still buying print magazines. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I think that sort of an interesting thing that, yeah, she wanted something, you know, more than laundry for her Instagram mm. page. I don't know. I'm sort of, I'm sort of partway between liking and not really thinking much of it. Like, it, mm. it was enough of a driving force for her yeah. angle in the storyline is uh, yeah, what I'm saying. But, uh, yeah, I think overall as the show, you know, we've said at the top of the episode, vacation episodes rarely are the big ones. And, yeah, I felt that, yeah, this episode showed... Pretty good restraint, especially in that setting. Yeah, for yeah. something that really could have gone off rails and gone terrible places, it didn't. So uh, it's weird to praise something for what it didn't do and the, its coherency and memory. Yeah. But hey, here we are. Yeah. yeah, like you said at the beginning, it really felt like more of just a regular Simpsons episode that just happened to be taking place in Costa Rica. I do feel like mm. a lot of the best Simpsons travel episodes in the modern era, like the other one I like to think of it, of the episode that they went to Boston, how that yeah. episode, you know, kind of opened with that whole sports rivalry and like they established that story up front with Homer and Bart. And this one yeah. really did a good job, you know, finding a good character grounding point with Homer and Evelyn and just kind of building around that instead of letting the like location be the driving point. Yeah, mm. absolutely. hundred percent. But yes or no, would you watch this episode again? Yeah, laundry, I guess. <laughs> but then you're going to have an Instagram like Marge if you do that. <laughs> That's true. Well, hey, I mean, a pr I really need to fold my laundry, so I would be proud of that moment because I have like four baskets filled up that I just keep pulling from instead of uh, folding and hanging. So that's all right. I'm, I wish I was Marge. Oh, take a photo. Make some hashtags. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag adulting. I think her last one was uh, Yas Clean, I think she put on that. <laughs> <laughs> I missed that. Uh, nice. That's very good. But actually, I've sort of brought this one to you today, Jims, because like in our recent video, I can't quite remember what it is. Sorry. Uh, you did mention this one as sort of a modern good episode. Uh, yeah, I think I think I would definitely watch this one. This one, it was on my big book of modern episodes that like, I don't know, like are, I'm not going to use the word watchable, but I think are noteworthy that like mm. are worth like combing through. So mm. yeah, I definitely watch this one again. Yeah, and I would too. And, you know, episodes that we want to watch again, we like to think about what playlist we'd put them in. What are some other uh, Simpsons episodes that would pair nicely with this yeah. one? Do something on uh, Patty's relationships. Oh, yeah. Although there's something about marrying sucks a Look, lot. I, I, I didn't say they'd be good episodes, just watching, <laughs> you know, how the show handles it and also her, you know, timeline through the show. Yeah, sure. Didn't say you'd enjoy all of it, just that they fit together. Or how about you could pair this one with uh, Homer and Patty and Selma relationship episodes and throw in a Goo Goo Guy Pan, you guys' favorite episodes, onto the list for a Selma <laughs> example. The episode which I cannot get anyone to willingly review. <laughs> I'll review it. <laughs> You'll eventually get to that one. Uh, yeah. God damn. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, of course, you know, good vacation episodes. Yeah, throw this in with mm. Bart versus Australia and others. <laughs> yeah look there were mixed feelings on the simpsons go to africa one i remember that i still um, didn't mind in the name of the grandfather where they go to ireland yeah there are elements to chip from these ones yeah but you know no episode is perfect and we've certainly uh mentioned how this episode isn't perfect and we'd like to explore what we'd like to change about them so bt we'll start with you what are some things you'd like to change about living la pura vida Yep, look, just develop one of the two emotional focuses. Have Marge freaking out about trying to get this perfect family vacation. Focus more on Patty and Evelyn, maybe, or even Lisa's stress. It feels like they're all 10% there, and they need to be at least 33.333 each. Mm. You, or at least develop one to the point where it really feels like there's an emotional core there. They all just felt a little undercooked to me. And I don't want to say more monkey chaos, because too much <laughs> will ruin it. I think that's just the right amount of monkey chaos. So I'm quite happy with that. <laughs> just the right amount of monkey chaos. <laughs> yep. Put that blurb on the back yeah, of the yeah. DVD. You always want to be left wanting more monkey chaos. So you want to leave something on the table. <laughs> Planet of the Apes took it way too far. Oh yeah, just absurd. There were just 
They left it on the table and everywhere else. It's just the entire planet. Yeah. Uh, how about you, Jim? What would you uh, like to change about this episode? I largely agree about the Patty angle of it. I really do wish that we got a little more of Patty in the first half. It, it really does feel like it turned into a Homer episode when it should have sure. been a Homer and Patty and Evelyn episode. Like up until that waterfall scene, there really wasn't a lot of Patty and Evelyn even getting along. So I think they could improve it by adding a little more of that character dynamic up front. Um, I think that they could also, I think they could back off the Lisa angle just a little. Like I expressed my opinion on that earlier but i mm. like i think if she was just a little less obsessive i think i'd be on board uh, but other than that i like there's very little i would really change i think if you just dial up evelyn a little more and then take a little bit off of lisa i think it would be greatly improved yep you know what, what i'm gonna say to change this one to get rid of that lisa angle altogether i did enjoy like the anxiety of you know a little bit but if you want to just get rid of it and free up some space for everything else have the van houtens be like hey, we own this place, your room will be comped, you just have to pay for food and drink and stuff. That makes it cheap, so then Lisa's not panicking about it, and we can, ju- and we don't have to have that, you know, kind of plot twist reveal, which you could, it, this could just be a story about Marge obsessing about the perfect holiday and Patty and Evelyn and Homer, because I think that would give it a lot more focus. I feel like I don't necessarily mind the Kirk reveal stuff. I, I do feel like they did kind of foreshadow it. They, they did talk about Kirk's financial situation. So I guess I don't necessarily mind the mystery aspect and that it was expensive. But yeah, like the whole thing doesn't quite... You're right that there's a lot going on between the Evelyn and mm. Homer stuff and then the Kirk mystery stuff. And it's not entirely yeah. balanced. No, I just want to free up some time for the stuff I would prefer they focused on, basically. Because again, there's no intro to this one, so they everything you see is just packed to the brim. Yeah. Well, I guess I'm personally, yeah, I'm missing like the other family sort of reassuring that the Simpsons, like, don't worry, this is a very cheap holiday, you know. You see Kirk mm-hmm. constantly adding to the bill and like it would have just been little things like, Oh, don't worry, you know, the bill's never, you know, too bad at the end. Like but I guess that's, you know, less entertaining and just more, hey, how does this actually function? But, like, I think it's just repeating what I said before. I, just, I wish it was something other than the salt and pepper shakers. I wish it was a combination of, yeah, Homer and Evelyn being boorish together, yet Homer is the one that gets blamed on it mm-hmm. in combination with finding out that Lisa and Bart were snooping around. That's what got them offside. And yeah. I think you said it before, Beach, just having them go, oh, we were worried about wanting to bring you this family mm. with us. We just, yeah. Yeah, because early on, there's the implication that Van Houtens do this every year and they've never invited the Simpsons before, despite, you know, Bart and Milhouse being best friends. And despite Marge going, oh, this is the only reason I let you and Milhouse stay friends. That, that was a <laughs> yeah. What the fuck, Marge? <laughs> yeah, remember that emotional moment? Yeah. yeah, that episode where like Bart and Milhouse can no longer be friends, it really kind of puts yeah. in perspective Marge getting the two back together again and talking to Luann. <laughs> yeah, which is all like, you know, they're too young for girls and they're always sheep in the school play. Please let them be friends. And also, Costa Rica. <laughs> yeah. Marge's thought bubble. All she's thinking, Costa Rica, Costa Rica. <laughs> all right, we are here. It's time for everyone's final notes. Now it's time and now it's time for our final notes. Everyone's final notes. Jim, do you have uh, any final notes? Okay, I got one for you. I really do enjoy the the weird callback to uh, Kirk Van Houten's cracker factory job. How his uh, mm-hmm. how his ancestor came yeah. from like a cracker company. That was a nice poll they had in there. Just got a foot up on a big carton of crackers. Yeah, I, I like yeah. that. Also, another note here is, uh, what is the deal with Kirk and all of that muscle powder stuff in his room? Uh, yeah, that was weird. <laughs> Yeah, it does kind of work in character form. He does kind of seem like the kind of guy who would secretly have a lot of that kind of stuff. Yeah, who just thinks just eating the powder is going to get him buff rather than, you know, trying. Yeah, effort. yeah. to once again bring it back to South Park. Again, surprising. I'm not a fan of the show anymore. But yeah, <laughs> that Cartman thinks, yeah, by eating the powder without working out. And yeah, Bart points that out. Yeah quite enjoyed that mm-hmm. and then my third note the only note that i have at the end is um once again marge's voice like this one really hit me pretty hard because she's like right after that like non-intro she's literally the first thing we hear and it kind of mm-hmm. hit me by a ton of bricks i was like oh no the voice like there it is again yeah so it's a little rough in this one Poor julie kavanagh i felt this one yeah out right out of the gate as well dated the episode where luann's like oh they had a five hour energy drink and then watched russian dash cam footage all night <laughs> I actually quite like that. I thought that was a modernization I felt worked because I imagine that's probably what kids are doing at sleepovers. Oh, it's Brad. 
We should do it at a sleepover one time. Yeah. That sounds fun. <laughs> we have literally just hung out, hung over, and watched dank memes for hours before, and it was great. Yeah, I remember, can't remember if it was a night or a morning, but yeah, when Jordan just yep. did a playlist it was, it was of the... like three and a half hours of meme videos. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> BT, do you have any other notes? Okay, I've got the note, is Lisa horny for frogs? Because there's a bit where they have like a fold-out magazine, and that's, you know, your typical joke of, you know, but then her reaction is like, oh, there's a translucent skin. I, the- a tympanic membrane. Yeah, sorry, that won't quit. It's like, I know what you're going for. I think you overstepped it a little bit there. Mm. The, the home has a good speech of like, we've got the mortgage, the reverse mortgage, and something else. I think the the house is owned by the car. <laughs> I did kind of like that they're in such bad financial situation, they don't even know what's going on anymore. Doesn't Ned Flanders still own their house? Is that canon still? I don't oh, remember yeah. how that ended. No, loan again naturally, yeah. Uh, a homer line I did like, despite the fact that I probably shouldn't, was, uh, now urinating on a private merry-go-round is not public urination. <laughs> I, I kind of like, again, it speaks to a larger story and doesn't uh, ruin anything. Where, where's the line? When, you know, if I'm on my private property and peeing outside, does that count? We'll leave that for the courts to decide. <laughs> and yeah, when they're going around the table, oh, Lacey, this is what you'll like, but you can get a machete. And Maggie... You can chew the guidebook. I thought that was so cute. <laughs> uh, that was such yeah, a cute. That, that was a cute one. That's very baby. And yeah, uh, my only other note was yeah, this is another case of an, a rare El Barto joke, which I actually liked. Which because mm-hmm. bringing into the larger point of Bart's machete, which is just horrifying to think about, mm. is I don't think they hung on it too long, and no, it was it was just a thing he had. And it was convenient, especially, yeah, when he, yeah, Kirk busts in the room, they're hiding under the bed. I was like, oh, the rumblies are coming. Like, just a great way for them to bail out of the room. Like, I thought yeah. the machete was well used. Mm-hmm. Gotta say, I was really glad when he just hit the side of the bed because, like, that joke was okay, but I was like, I've had enough of this scene. So yeah. when he did yeah. that, I was like, oh, thank God we're out of here. Yeah. Yeah, we- I was very, Kirk's all, oh, there's something in my tummy. Oh, no. I was like, okay, I get it. Shut up already. Yeah, I don't know. I thought coming back to Kirk's patheticness, despite how confident this yeah. whole trip makes him being, yeah, the local guide and all that sort of shit. Like, I think it can't be said enough. Yeah, Holiday Kirk pretending he's one of them. Like, it's just, mm. it's so funny to me. <laughs> all right, it is time to rank this thing on the Simpsons Index. We rank using our six point scale, which starts down the bottom at failure. But maybe if the episode was just. Eh. You give it a participant. But for the positive rankings, you got OK Bronze, Good Silver, Excellent Gold, but for the best, of the very best, the episodes which The Simpsons could not exist without, you give Cubic Zirconia. I'll go first, let me show you how it's done. I am giving this one a silver. I There was a point where I was like, is this gold? No, this isn't gold. Wow. Is this gold? But, like, man, if they did stick the landing a lot, if that third act was Mm. consistent with the first two, maybe. But for now... I will go with a silver. BT, what do you reckon? Uh, Well, I came in on a participant, but I think you guys have talked me up. I'm going to go with a bronze because it's coherent and there's a beginning, middle and end. I feel like the third act is definitely the weakest, but that's, uh, you know, I had a good good enough time. I had some laughs. I got to see some monkey chaos. So I'm going to sit with a nice bronze. What else could you hope for? And Jim, finish it up, please. Okay, ooh, I feel like I'm the tiebreaker on this one. Yeah. Um, I, I actually went back and forth between silver and bronze a lot, so it's kind of funny it's coming down to this. Um, but I think yep. in the end, I think I'm going to go more aggressively and give this one a silver, actually. Right. When it comes down to it, I think there are some problems with the story, and I would like a little more of Evelyn and Patty together. But I, I don't mm-hmm. think there's really that much wrong with it that would drag it down to bronze for me. I think the characters are right. They do the vacation aspects uh, correctly, and um, I think it's just a fun time. So I'll, I'll go silver yeah absolutely all right and that'll equal a dull silver it will now be yeah this is our top ranked episode of season 31 now wow i will admit when uh when you sent over we're doing season 31 episode 7 i was like oh no (laughs) what have you done (laughs) i don't know like jim i don't know if you how many episodes from the more recent seasons you've seen but like from a few reports people are saying like they're trying a bit harder lately Mm. Yeah, I think season 33 has been pretty positively received. Like, there's been a couple episodes that were very positive received, like A Series Flanders in particular. Mm. But at the same time, I will preface that, that there have been some stinkers in season 33. So yeah. I'm not going to say we've reached a renaissance, but they are definitely doing interesting things right now. Yeah, I mean, we've not done too many from 33, but yeah, you can definitely see there's a bit more effort going on. 
Yeah, well, we've only done one, and that was yeah. Portrait of a Lackey on Fire, the Smithers' uh, new boyfriend yeah. episode. which could have tanked so hard and didn't, so... Uh, yeah, but just looking, yeah. you know, of the episodes from the 30s that we've reviewed, yeah, this is our equal first with season 32's yeah. uh, Undercover Burns, yeah, which we, we liked a little bit. Yeah, it's super wacky episode, but had some good content. Also didn't stick the third act, which, yeah. Yeah, gotta stick the landing. Yep. So that's it for Living La Pura Vida. So now let's move on to the HD era where we're going to watch an episode called The Princess Guide, not to be confused with the 2019 RPG that was poorly received. <laughs> yeah, this was an annoying episode to review, because uh, 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 research rather, because every time I looked it up, it kept coming up with this stupid RPG game that no one liked. <laughs> I'm so curious now. <laughs> anyway, we're going to uh, watch that. We'll be back. And we are back, and we just watched an episode from the HD era. This was Season 26, Episode 15, The Princess Guide. First released in March of 2015, it was directed by Timothy Bailey, written by Brian Kelly. Wait, oh, that's the same director and writer from last episode. There you go. In this oh. episode, Homer is put in charge of looking after a Nigerian princess and naturally ends up dropping her off at Moe's, and they strike up a bit of a friendship. Hey, y'all, what do we think? This is worse. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Like, almost immediately, I was like, well, this isn't as good as the last one. Interesting that it's the same writer, though. So he, he's le clearly learned some lessons. Yeah. Uh, you'll get there one day, <laughs> Bailey. No, Timothy Bailey was the director. Ah, uh, okay. Not yeah, to be con confused yeah. with Timothy Bailey, the Australian weatherman. That's how I remembered his name. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, this one wasn't offensive. Once again, you know... Uh, Dodge that bullet. Yeah, Simpsons <laughs> dealing with racism always worked out in the past. And this one, I was like, oh boy, what have I done? But yeah. no, it wasn't offensive. I think it's worth seeing is that it's kind of boring. Yeah, I would agree. I actually started uh, ordering sushi at the end of this because <laughs> I was like completely checked out. Mm. Yeah, it's... Hey, uh, sushi. It's a very, like, hangout episode of The Simpsons, just, like, characters get together, they kind of like each other, but they don't really like each other that much, or at least Kemi doesn't, and, and then they just kind of go their separate ways in the end. It's it's very mild, is the word for it, I guess. Yeah, hmm. just not much happens. It's not very exciting. Even, you know, a runaway princess has gone for a day and a night. Like, yeah. there's no tension from the other side of the people looking for her either. I mean, it could have been worse. I'll put it again. We'll put the best light we can on it. Uh, the second they introduced someone from Nigeria, I was like, oh, oh boy, this is going to be uh, interesting. Mm. But I think they did sidestep uh, anything uncomfortable with that. But um, the remainder is not infuriating, but not terribly engaging. Mm. I will say with the Nigerian stuff with Mr. Burns, it did kind of seem like we were in trouble at the beginning, like, like with the whole monkey's oh, yeah. brain joke, you know? Yeah. Like, they're definitely, like, subverting our expectations, like, especially mm. with Mr. Burns. But at the same time, they did very earnestly do that joke about the goats, where, like, he's offended yeah. by the goats, but then he actually does accept 20 million goats, so... Kind of talking out of both sides of your mouth there, Simpsons, I yeah, think. a little bit, but to that point, 20 million goats is probably worth a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> That's I don't true. know how you manage that many goats, but, uh, you know, e even if they're worth a dollar a piece, which I'm sure, assuming a goat is worth much more... That's that's a lot. <laughs> and check goatstocks.com. How much? Yeah, can... it's like in uh, 30 Rock where it's like uh, 30 million doll hairs. Did you say doll hairs? Yeah, they're not worthless. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely. All right, well, let's hook into this one. Jim, we'll start with you. For better or worse, what's a moment that stands out to you? Okay, for me, it's definitely the Mr. Burns Smithers fantasy throughout the episode. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I definitely get why you picked this one and that one, because I guess today is gay relationships on an island day, I think. They can't, I suppose. <laughs> except, except, except this, except this one. What a playlist. Was, yeah, I know, right? Except this one was obviously a fantasy, but um, I think that one really stood out. I really, one of the angles that I did like about the episode was that they went through the whole angle of Smithers sabotaging the storyline like they mm. have to find a way to like bring homer into the storyline and they've done it in several different ways by now but the idea of smithers blatantly trying to sabotage mr burns storyline i think that one is an interesting one and i think the whole fantasy yeah. sequence itself is funny in itself like there's a lot of weird stuff in there you know like burns like saying that he was pretending to be gay his whole life you know yeah yeah or 
I really went back and forth on this one. I like that's the premise because, you know, when Mr. Burns is trying to decide who's going to look after this Nigerian princess, why the hell would he choose Homer? Well, he's forgotten. Fair enough. But I like the angle that Smithers is like, wants this to fail and therefore is like, yeah, of course we'll use Homer Simpson. So that worked really well. But yeah, there was something, I think the turning point for me was when it went from Smithers imagining just hanging out with Mr. Burns and maybe something will happen to Mr. Burns openly saying, oh, I can't believe I pretended not to be in love with you all those years like that was a little weird. Yeah. And then to have the final sting of Smithers seeing old Mr. Burns clones walk around and being like, well, guess I'm just going to fuck these clones instead. That was was what was implied, wasn't it? (laughs) Like, yeah. I mean, how else do you take that? Uh, It was just like, guys... God, that's a weird and creepy thing for him to say. Just mm, really went the full gambit on this one, didn't you? To a kind of, maybe a change of scenery will mean a change of heart for him, and maybe that'll mean something for us to get a fuck these clones. Yeah. yeah. Whereas, yeah, there was something, I don't know, charming about the fantasies mm. where it was just, I don't know, sort of not as explicit as that. Yeah. And yeah. I kind of liked the reprise of... You know, Burns having, due to budget cuts, his hounds recently were replaced with poodles, which, yeah, yeah, when he's like, release the hounds and they come bursting in, everyone's like, oh, cute, taking selfies. Uh, that's a good one. <laughs> How about you, BT? Uh, what stands out to you from this episode, for better or worse? Man, there is so much show and tell in this one that it's, it ruins some actually good jokes, mm. which really pissed me off. Like, it starts off Daddy Daughter Day, which, come to think of it, never really comes back again, whatever. There's a bit where, oh, for some reason, there's a lot of infertility at the power plant, then stirs his coffee with the nuclear rod and puts it in his pocket. Like, I got it. Like, the implication was funny enough. Brutal. Or there's a bit where, you know, Mr. Burns is like, oh, all I've got is my clothes on my back and my clones in my basement. And then it cuts to the clones like, oh, number 43 is missing. And then 43 is running through Mr. Burns. Like, guys, it was a funny line. You don't have to show me as well. Yeah. Well, they even did it with that electric car line. Like, he mentions the electric car, and then they cut away to him and Richard Branson. Mm. It's like, they did, like, four of those in a row, which, that's what I meant about, like, I immediately knew this one wasn't going to be as good as the last one, (laughs) because there's so much show and tell. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, And guest star of this episode, Richard Branson, who's... You could tell it was him, because that was some bad acting. Man, I kind of liked the idea that Branson's his Flanders, but... Yeah. I don't know, because of his bad the, delivery. The road to get there yeah. is just so tedious. Mm. And don't you know, this was the era of the show where they have to have a billionaire on every single episode. First <laughs> Elon Musk, now Richard Branson. Yeah. Well, they started out that thing with yeah, Mr. Burns going, oh, damn, Elon Musk and him saving the earth and everything like that. It's like, Jesus Christ, Simpson, calm down. They just want to make friends. Elon mm. Musk sucks. You don't want to be friends with him. <laughs> Look, the world has undergone a very weird transition with Elon Musk. At one point, he was very cool. And, uh, you know, around about the time he started to build flamethrowers for fun, things started to turn. And then he offered a submarine and then called everyone pedophiles and shit got weird from there. Point being, this may have been made in an era where people are a bit more pro-Elon than they are now. Yeah, actually, me and my brothers were laughing at that presentation he did for that dumb fucking nintendo 64 looking car that he built and he was like not even the world's fastest baseball pitcher could break a window and then proceeds to do it twice (laughs) yeah there's still a lot of debate whether or not that was intentional to go viral but yeah that was fucking weird no matter which way you cut it yeah uh sorry yeah anyway you were saying bt I was just saying that there's a lot of those show than tell, which is very indicative of this era of The Simpsons, along with a lot of just background gags that are, hope you're not bored, audience, mm. look at this thing. I mean, just to flash forward a bit to the wackiness, during Take Your Daughter to Work Day, there's a guy in the background who's just unloading cats from, like, a pipe. Yeah. And it has n- like doesn't make sense and doesn't have anything to do with anything, and it's like... And the dialogue Homer had was actually pretty good, where at least, like, what's that do? I don't know. Who's that guy? I don't know. Well, you want to go to the cafeteria and get ice cream? How many flavors do they have? 12. Yeah. Like that he knows exactly, but everything else. That's a fine bit, but why? I just have spent the whole time just staring at this guy loading cats out of a pipe and like, what? Yeah, it's like have faith in the dialogue. The dialogue was good. Yeah, it's really like, I always have trouble with those too, because I almost forget what is being said. Like I can't walk and chew bubble yeah. gum at the same time where I'm so focused <laughs> on that joke. The like context of the verbal joke is completely lost on me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, much like our feelings about Elon Musk, it's very of the time of the Simpsons. And uh, yeah, yeah, this era is really known for that exact kind of humor. Well, carrying on from that, what stood out to me was... I kind of liked where this Homer-Lisa story was going, and I'm so bummed that it was dropped, because... I know. Like, 
I thought Homer's whole trading up to build a lunch for it was beautiful. Yeah, yeah I love that bit. That was the bi- biggest moment of heart I really liked. And it's a stupid skill Homer has. And the fact they didn't make any massive leaps in logic, like all he has is one corn chip and you think oh no one's gonna want that but he trades it for like a used tea bag and then makes multiple cups of tea from that and it actually builds in a way that's very clever mm. i was like okay I, you didn't just walk up to a guy and be like have this one corn chip and i'll take your entire the salad, lunch, yeah. whatever <laughs> yeah and it was a quick sequence too like they didn't spend way too long like that sequence could have gone on and on and on of him negotiating but instead they just like quick montage it mm. and it's actually very adorable yeah. yeah, and I didn't even mind Lenny and Carl going, oh, what about the presentation? You know, you taste with your eyes mm. first, and it's like, just steals a checkerboard from and then, like, <laughs> Lisa loves it, and they, they have a hug, and it's nice. Yeah, and it serves the plot for Mr. Burns seeing them hug and be like, okay, these two, that's uh, that guy, that's the one I'm going to have to look after this Nigerian princess. So it serves a purpose, and yeah, it was probably, I think, the best part of the episode. Yeah. I just really don't know where I'm going to end up landing on this one because it's like, I didn't hate the stuff with, yeah, Princess Kemi and Mo. Like, mm. I actually kind of adored their chemistry. Yeah, I like that it wasn't a romance in the end yeah. because, you know, she was just met someone who she'd never met that kind of person before and Mo wasn't like a bitter, twisted person when he finds out it wasn't romantic like he thought. She's just just nice to him. Yeah, it doesn't it like they have chemistry together, but they don't have so much chemistry that it clearly mm. feels like they're falling in love. So like I don't know if you guys were the same as me, but I did like think this was a Mo romance episode going into it. So I was kind of mm. questioning like like what does she really see in him? Like they don't have that much chemistry together. So then in the end when she isn't really into Mo, like I actually do buy that. Like I think they handled their relationship pretty well. Yeah, and honestly, yep. I think they handled Mo's initial bitterness over the Nigerian prince scam. Like, I like that he's so stupid that he still thought it was a Nigerian prince who did scam him. Like, then that that also went nowhere. That's like the only reason for that to exist is so he talks to her. Uh, I, th- I think it's kind of good that it was dropped, though. Like, I know it's good that it's dropped, but it's also it was just I don't know. It was very weird that that was the in. Yeah. And then uh, doesn't matter. I don't. But, uh, I don't know why they kept that in the episode. To be honest, when I actually when I looked back on it, I had that completely wrong. I thought the initial setup was Mr. Burns was talking to a Nigerian king, and that like Smithers yeah. would think that it was a scam, like that that part of it would yeah, be yeah. up front. Uh, that's what I thought. And, and then he ends up being real, but instead they go with Mo somehow having five thousand dollars. I don't know where Mo got $5,000. <laughs> but yeah, and then they completely kind of drop that. Like, he gets over it immediately when he falls asleep. Weird. Yeah. Oh, uh, and again, like, I really actually, I loved Mo's little goodnight moon little thing going on here. Where Yeah, he rips the felt off his pool table, makes a little yeah. pillow out of nuts, and then does the whole goodnight moon routine. I, I really liked this. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit much to just have that's the reason he she stays is that she realizes oh this man has no one being nice to him but yeah and i appreciate the reprise later when he's sewing the pool table back together it's like i did not think this through <laughs> yeah i quite enjoyed that how about the wackiness was this a particularly wacky episode of the simpsons uh, although again cats in a pipe and then later on when the princess is all like ah oh, this is my first montage and then homer walks out of the tire fire come to think of mm. it yeah he just appears out of tire fire space I mean, we are also talking about an episode that ends with all those Burns clones with Smithers, so... Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think there's a degree of wackiness there. Yeah, but, I mean, aside from those sort of montage bits, yeah, like, not super wacky. And, yeah, I didn't... Again, I didn't hate this... Mo- I didn't hate is going to be my, you know, drink every time <laughs> I say this line. Yeah, I didn't hate this montage. I thought the paint fades were all pretty nice and content was all right yeah the misdirect with the throwing the baseball getting the big toy yeah. and just turns out he was robbing the store all cute jokes. that got me too yeah yeah i wasn't expecting that one it's one of those mm. one of those jokes where it's framed so close to him like okay there's gonna be a pullback and reveal but i didn't know what to what so i did appreciate it was just looting I felt like there's a lot of misdirection and screw the audience jokes in general. Like they really lean in heavy with that Carl, I'm not going to dress up like a Nigerian princess yeah. joke with the whole sitcom reveal. Like it seemed like every time the episode wanted to go off the rails, they like pulled things mm. back a little bit. Some restraint, my God. Yeah, I swear Family Guy did the exact same joke where it was, yeah, Peter Griffin going, yep, I'm not doing that. And they even do the screen flip thing. The woo. Yeah. See, I told you I'm not doing it. Yeah. Like, it was different enough, but still, I don't know. Uh, it's a sitcom trope and then a parody of the sitcom trope. There's only so many things you can do with it. 
But yeah, other than that, really not a super wacky episode. Not a lot of like big cartoon moments going on. Yeah, a lot of just uh, sitting around talking to Mo. Yeah, and sitting yeah. around negotiating goats and like, I mean, you can yeah. say the fantasy sequences as well, but again, they weren't super cartoony. They looked nice, like mm-hmm. some good color palettes going on there. That's not wacky. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they kind of do like an embroidered image of uh, Mo and the princess on each activity, and that it's it's different enough. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, going on from that, how was the heart in this episode? How was the emotional? The um, again, the lunchroom scene was really where I felt the most of it, and you know, there's something to be said about you know them having a friendship rather than uh, any kind of romance. I kind of wish maybe there was an implication that they were continuing to maybe trade emails to tie into the Nigerian prince scam, something. But yeah, it's there-ish. Yeah, I didn't really feel much emotionality at all. Like, even compared to the last one, I don't think there was as much here. And like BT just commented, I think that's a little on purpose where they're just platonic friends in the end. And yeah, actually, does he ever talk to her ever again? It does seem like she just kind of whisks away and this is just this Mm. nice memory for both of them, which I think there's room for that, you know. But I think if you're looking for, like, emotionality, there's not going to be much here. Even, like, Homer's speech about parenting at the end since like lisa's barely even in the episode as we discussed Mm. like even the emotionality there doesn't really land i think the last joke is actually like that he can't strangle a girl is where they land on it so yeah they're not really leaning into the emotionality here yeah and it's weird like at the end as well they do that mo like oh it's three years later and i look terrible and like he's reflecting on this and like yeah this did nothing for me yeah, they didn't really know how to end this one, which is a shame, because even just the implication they still email is something. Yeah. He follows her on Instagram like most friends do these days. Yeah, like, the point of comparison I'm coming to is, like, any Tina Maya Mo, where, yeah, he uh, he dates Maya, the little person, and, like, at the end, Homer's like, well, you know, it didn't work out, but, you know, you, at least you know that at some point someone liked you and that's enough. And, like, that, mm. that was a really nice button for that episode, which was a bit uneven at times. Yeah. And, yeah, this was missing sort of that. Yeah, just needed a button, something to feel good at at the end, which is probably why I don't even think about that being the emotional core of this episode, is that it just felt unfinished. Yeah, I think that's about all you can say about it. Yeah. But also- <laughs> I'm surprised how much conversation we got out of an episode where I ordered sushi in the end because uh, well, I wasn't in game. Well, like, I was trying to even remember their fucking conversations and like I just watched this thing and it's just, it's left my brain. Oh, I have no idea what they actually had the conversation. I remember writing in my notes, what does Kemi see in Mo? But even <laughs> while I was writing that, I still don't remember what they actually had in common or what she found charming about him. I mean, I guess she liked his like down to earthiness, I guess, and that he was yeah. kind to her and he was nice to her. But in terms of like actual things they have in common, there's not really a lot there. Yeah. No, absolutely not. But I gotta say, uh, voice actress Yaya Da Costa, I think, did an amazing job as Princess Kemi. Yep. Mm-hmm. She's been in a whole bunch of stuff. All My Children, Ugly Betty, Chicago Med, and she played Whitney Houston in the Lifetime television movie oh, about wow. like yeah. Even a lifetime television movie, you gotta you gotta bring your A game to play Whitney Houston. Oh, absolutely. I've been told it was a really good feature. I've been meaning to watch that. And yeah, just while we're here in guest stars as well, Kevin Michael Richardson again, he's basically a regular at this point, but yeah, he was mm-hmm. playing the Nigerian King and apparently John Lovitz had a small role in this episode as well. Really? Yeah. Yeah. What, what, the, the, hell hell, what the hell was that? I remember when that paparazzi person talked and I heard him and I was like, wait a minute, is that John Lovitz? Like I really did recognize uh, him, but it's like, why the hell did they get John Lovitz yeah. to come in to do like two lines for a nobody character? Was he just around at the time? Uh, yeah. Thank you for reminding me about that because I, when I was reading that out, I'm like, oh, Wikipedia's fucking with me again because they've listed his name as Enrico Irritazio as well. So I'm like, uh, I think Wikipedia's fucking <laughs> pulled, yeah. a, pulled one Pulling on me. Pulling a fast one on old Elliot. <laughs> but no, thank you, Jay. I Like, yeah, so yeah, that's it. It was the paparazzo. Yeah, quite a small role to, yeah, bother getting in John Lovitz for. You're right. He must have just been in the building or something. Or, you know, if someone had dinner with him and recorded the line on their phone. Or, uh, yeah, why would you get him in for that? Yeah, well, especially because around this time, this was not when John Lovitz was like, regular guest starring in the show like yeah we're Mm. well truly past that but there you go 
Yeah, they've been using Llewellyn and Sinclair, like, weirdly enough, in later episodes, yeah. so he might have yeah. just been doing one of those. Yeah, that's true, and to diminishing effect. Um, Maybe they're just like, hey, guys, look, John needs a paycheck. <laughs> uh, can we just give him anything Yeah, just to give him a day? <laughs> he was not a popular dude at this point, and still really mm. isn't. Um, ultimately, did this feel like an episode of The Simpsons? A very muted one for like such a wacky premise to be so grounded. I'm surprised and a little impressed, but yeah, I'm going to struggle to remember this one. Yeah, I mean, it felt like a Simpsons episode. Nobody was really like out of sorts. Mm. Like everybody felt like themselves, they didn't go too overboard. I'm struggling to think of anything Marge did in the episode now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Um, oh, she called up Homer just to have a bitch. It's like, what are you doing babysitting? I want you to. And oh, yeah. Hang up on her. Like, yeah. Yeah, though I kind of like his line of, uh, you know, if you're babysitting, you could do some babysitting at home. And he's all like, but I'm babysitting a princess. I can't babysit the common folk. Tongues will go a wagging. <laughs> I do like kind of regal Homer. Anytime that comes out, I usually get a good laugh. Sure, sure. Very good use of the word a wag. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, but like I said at the top, it's like it's not an offensive episode. We don't have any major character breaks. You can say that's a little jerk ass Homer, but whatever. But yes, no. Would you watch this one again? Eh, I mean, if it's on and I'm cozy, again, maybe laundry. There's nothing else to mine from it. There's, I would not watch this with any purpose. Yeah, I, I think my answer is, I guess I would watch it again. <laughs> like, I don't know. I'm not a good person to ask for this because I have to watch these for <laughs> Simpsons YouTube research. Like, this is a kind of an important Mo episode. I All guess. Right. Well, actually, I don't even know. Is this even an important Mo episode? Like, I'm not even sure about that now. Well, no, if you were, yeah. like, you know, playlist, you'd put this in. If we're building up the Mo relationships, this might not even count. Like, yeah, yeah. but I, mean, I guess he yeah. sort of saw it as romantic, so maybe, but... But I feel like we get nothing new from him. Yeah, that's the new question now. Would this make a real Jim's episode? <laughs> <laughs> I don't see a actual episode review for this one coming along. Like, I don't think there's really yeah. much to latch on to. But it's definitely one that I might reference if I'm, like, talking about maybe character arcs or something like that. But, yeah, yeah, yeah uh, like a footnote at best, you know. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, I brought this one because of, yeah, your investment in the idea of the eventual, and it will happen, Selmo shipping. <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I don't know about that anymore, actually, if you guys have watched the recent right. season. Oh, who, who's gotten hitched? Oh, well, nobody is hitched yet, but um, actually it's kind of a weird context, but Mo does get a girlfriend in season 33. <laughs> That, like, suppose that that actually sticks. So I don't know if you want oh. me to spoil it or anything. I saw Maya doing a reappearance. Yeah, basically, they brought back Maya and they got back together again. So, oh, um, there we go. So I think that's a thing now. Oh, cool. Yep. Well, well, I mean, nice, I remember we... Yeah, their reason for breaking up was stupid, so I'm kind of glad that happened. Yeah, you guys should see the episode, because I, personally, I don't think the new episode was that great, but that episode does totally pretend like the end of that episode never happened. Like, that, that oh. like oh, nobody right. likes the end of that episode, and neither do the writers, clearly. <laughs> Good. It was bad. Well, I remember us saying, you know, and often we're like, yeah, Simpsons have the guts to change up stuff, you know. Mm. You have done it in the past, and yeah, we thought they match, so... Yeah, yeah, keen to check that out. We'll have to bring Phil back again to do that one. Yes. But what would you like to change about this one? BT, we'll start with you. Oh, wow. Um, Make it memorable in any way, shape, or form. Mm. Maybe an idea of why uh, the princess is interested in Mo, even as a friend. Like, again, we don't really remember what they talked about. Even if they went with the old, you know, she's been locked up in a palace where all her needs are met, has never met her, never gone to like the real world. It's trite, but you know, it works for a reason. Or even she gets in some kind of trouble. I don't know, but it's just, yeah, what's here is just kind of forgettable. And that's kind of the biggest downer of this episode. Mm. How about you, Jim? What do you reckon? Yeah, I kind of feel like to tag on to the energy level this episode, I kind of wish that they did more with the Homer chasing them angle that was referred to earlier. Yeah, that's right. Like, it's kind of contrived how Homer loses them. Like, he ends up in the drunk tank, you know? And then afterwards, yeah. he just kind of disappears while they montage. And I think if they had done more of, like, a cat and mouse game, like maybe them going on yeah. a date while trying to avoid Homer at the same time, maybe it would have injected some energy into the episode. But as mm. is, it's just a little too sleepy, I think the way they structured it. Yeah, that's carrying on from that. Like, I wish it, yeah, it was like cat and mouse and dog chase where, yeah, yeah. Homer was chasing them, but then also he's being chased by the King and Burns because they've. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they're being sabotaged by Smithers a little bit more. Oh, that would be awesome. 
Yeah, yeah because yeah. Smithers would be t- sabotaging Burns, who'd be trying to chase Homer, who'd be trying to chase Kemi. Like, yeah, like now, man, now I'm annoyed because I kind of yeah. wish we got that <laughs> version of the episode and we watched this yeah, like more mild fun. version. Yeah. Yeah, seriously, inject the paparazzi thing much earlier and then yeah. that way that sort of queered the deal and Burns is, yeah, set off on reprimanding Homer and also finding, like, I think it just could have been so much more exciting than what we had here, which, yeah, was quite dull. All right, Jims, any other final notes? Um, any more notes here? I do kind of like that line about how um, the king says that, that she's an impetuous adult who does what she wants. Yeah. They kind of lampshaded the whole kind of storyline of, you know, she's an adult woman. She can do whatever she wants. It's not easy to just like control what she's doing so yeah i like that joke uh there's also that moment where moe's tooth falls out of his face which was weird yeah. and it kind of clicks back in like a, i don't know like a, like it's hinged yeah it's satisfying sound effect but horrifying implications it, it does kind of bring back to that season one mo who's missing a lot of teeth so i can mm. get mm. i can get behind that one yeah and then last i got this uh there's that weird scene between smithers and lisa where she's talking about how she aspires to be in jazz and she's like oh poor Mm. thing like they have like this weird sympathetic moment together yeah yeah never dream big i'm gonna have a career in jazz oh you poor guy yeah yeah remember marge's advice aim low aim so low no one will care if you succeed there's butter under my face (laughs) how about you pt any other notes there's a bit where it's like, oh, you speak English. She's like, yes, I speak five languages. Oh, nobody does. I do kind of like that. I didn't then need her going through all five. Um, yeah, when Homer gets arrested, because, you know, he's all, ah, there's a Nigerian princess around. And then the quicker mark gets robbed and, you know, Police Chief Wiggum doesn't arrest, was it arrest Gill, I think? Arrest and Gill like, and ah, Apu, get, yeah. Get in the yeah. back, drunky. And it's like, this is just a weaker version of the invisible typewriter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it was just, did nothing for me and I didn't like it. Uh, but the part I did quite pop for is at the end where the, you know, paparazzi are all like, ah, oh, what happened between you and this guy? And they're all like, well, you know, a certain princess may have had enjoyed her day out with a certain someone. And the paparazzi guy's like, oh, this is vague. This is so vague. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I quite like that. Yeah, my only other notes, I really did like how Mr. Burns was like, and the cafeteria will be serving, you know, roast bison with Lake Beaver on, like, horrifying oh, yeah, everybody. Some Burnsisms. And yeah, and then it was in the background of the next scene, I mm-hmm. thought, oh, it was very good. I also kind of popped for the line, now watch her like a hawk, and then when Homer gets surprised, he goes, gah! Yeah, I felt like that was coming. I know, it was silly, but I liked it. I <laughs> And I also liked the, I'll take you someplace that's fun with a capital F, and... Is that F from the health department, eh? Eh? Mm. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Lampshaded a bit too much for me, but I like the concept. Mm. Bring it back to the negative, though. I hated the pedicap guys. Like, I do a thing like an airline pilot. It's uh, just, yeah. I'm about to do a drag out joke, and here's me doing that dragged out joke. That's not that funny. Oh, he's brutal. Yeah. And to leave it again on a positive note, and again, positive silly note, she was like, yeah, I like him in the same way as, you know, Snow White does to Dopey. And he's like, why does people keep making that comparison? Yeah. And I even didn't mind the little ear wiggle as well, like in a reference to that old Disney cartoon. I didn't notice that. Man. Yeah, I didn't even notice an ear wiggle. Yeah, he did the little Dopey ear wiggle. I thought, again, like subtle for season 26 mm-hmm. Simpsons. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. It is time to rank this thing. Ooh, I don't know where I'm going, so I'll make other people go first. BT. Look, I want to give it better to an episode that really could have fucked it up much harder than they did and could have been racist and didn't. Uh, But that said, I feel like Participant is kind of fair on this one. There's just not a lot to grab onto, and I feel like we pitched a better episode in this chat. It's fine. There's nothing really wrong with it. It's just bland and kind of forgettable, which is a shame because it has a lot of positive qualities, but eh. Jim, what do you reckon? Yeah, I'm I'm in the same boat. I feel like this is the most participant episode that has ever participated in the event of participating, I guess. It's just <laughs> like actually going into this when you pick this episode, I thought, oh, like this is like a bronze in my head when I, I was like, oh, mm. that episode's pleasant enough. But watching it this time, like I think the character dynamics are good, but, but I think what just pulls this one back is I just don't think the execution is there. It's just a little mm. too dull for its own good. The jokes aren't sharp enough, too much tell than show stuff going on in here um so while i i agree with bt that this could have been way 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 worse i just don't think Mm -hmm. the execution is there to be a bronze 
Yeah. Uh... Well, there's certainly an argument to be made for bronze because, again, it's coherent. <laughs> it's oh, for sure. Something to be said. But um, I don't know. <laughs> what are you feeling, Elliot? What do you, what do you, what do your heart gut say? Yeah, maybe, maybe maybe you'll bring up our grumpiness. Yeah, look, I think I am just going to go bronze. Just like the few nights I had a good at the end and like mm-hmm. that it was like nice but dull. Like, like it's only just getting a bronze, I've got to say. It really, like, I think you're right that it is so participatory, but that it's not bad is something. Again, it's nice but boring. So the fact that it's it's niceness makes me want to bronze it, yeah. but its overall boringness makes me participanty. But, I mean, overall, that'll make it a shiny bronze, and I feel like a shiny, pa- shiny participant, and I think that's exactly where it belongs. And it's the first shiny participant for season 26, so there you go. Really? Nice. There hasn't been any other shiny participants? That's surprising. I figured everybody, everything would be in the kind of participant-y kind of range. Season 26 does not do particularly well for us. Hold on, let me just scroll down to it. There are so many seasons of this show. Uh, you know? Yeah, looking at the spreadsheet, it's mostly participants, but, like, Dull and unanimous. A uh, couple mm-hmm. of bronzes in Opposites of Fract, Covercraft, and uh, Sky Police. But yeah, a few failures as well in Mathlete's Feet yeah. and Blazed and Confused and The Man Who Came to Be I, Dinner. <laughs> just scrolling through on Disney Plus was just like, ooh, this is a mixed bag of mostly bad. Yeah. Sky, Sky, Sky Police is a silver. What are you guys doing? I'm going to change that right now. <laughs> I'm going to log into your website and change that to at least the silver. Come on. I literally can't remember what else happens because I know the Sky Police bit is only at the beginning and very brief, but I literally don't remember what else happens other than Chief Wigan mulching two people by landing on them with a jetpack. That's all yeah. I remember. It's the card counting episode. Everybody loves the card counting episode. They do disguises and they get in trouble with the law and stuff. All right. And we learn a bit about uh, the Lovejoy's sex life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, could have done without that part. <laughs> could have done with a lot more of that part. I would remember it then. <laughs> all right. Well, let's jump. Oh, my God. 24 years back into the past. <laughs> oh, this is an all timer. This is where. You know, on the Simpsons Index, you know, having patience and holding episodes. Nope, mm-hmm. we got to save this one for later in the end. This is uh, this is a special one. We're going to go review Lisa's Substitute. Uh... I know. Our hearts are already <laughs> breaking and we'll be back. <laughs> And we are back, and we just watched our classic and final episode of the evening, and my goodness, what a classic this was. This was Season 2, Episode 19, Lisa's Substitute. First released in April of 1991, it was directed by Rich Moore, written by John Vitti, in this episode... Come on, you know it. It's Lisa's substitute, Mr. Bergstrom. You are Lisa Simpson. And also, uh, Bart has an election with Martin. Hey, y'all, what do we think? I mean, I assume we've all uh, wiped the tears from our eyes and uh, gotten on this Zoom call nice and fresh and ready. Yeah. Oh, I've st- yeah, man, this is cool. This is a just. I've a- still got tears going down my cheeks. <laughs> just <laughs> emotional buckshot. It's amazing. You know, I was surprised. You know, it didn't happen during like when Mr. Bergstrom was leaving, but Homer's speech, holy mm. fuck, I was a mess. <laughs> <laughs> that was just so beautiful. The ending of this episode definitely has a double whammy aspect to it, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh. But it's so well balanced because it's not like he suddenly figures out how to talk to Lisa. I like that he doesn't, but he yeah. tries, and that's the important thing. And I even, just, again, on the critical watch here, I never even really thought about how she even says, look, if you just want me to forgive you, and he cuts her off, he's like, no, 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 I want to do this. I'm just not good at it. It's like, ah, <laughs> hello, feelings. Yeah. I mean, it's funny, like, how emotionally mature, like, the, the show is at this stage. Like, it's season two. Well, yeah, what surprises me about this one is, like, you know, a lot of people will often say, yeah, the classic era is, like, three to eight or four to eight or something like that. And that's the problem with that, believe, because, like, season two has some goddamn gems in it. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, let's be clear on this one. It's not a big laugher, but just as a character piece and in his uh, emotional reaction is just stellar. Yeah. And in one where they're dividing the attention between Lisa and Bart a bit, like, Hmm. they both get their service. And, like, I mean, there could have been more to the Bart story, but I think it was just enough. Yeah, I think in a worse episode, the Bart stuff would be seen as a distraction. 
that's like, mm. you know, what is this Bart story taking away from the Lisa story? Like, why is her story so rushed and incomplete? But because this one is written so well with how Lisa's storyline comes together, the Bart stuff just yeah. serves as a really nice, breezy change of pace for the story, and we don't actually lose anything from Lisa. No, and as a good B story should do, and, you know, mm. and that they manage to dovetail it all at the end is, ah, oh, wonderful. Yep, chef's kiss. All right, let's see if we can find some bad things about this episode. How dare you? <laughs> Jim, we'll start with you. For better or worse, feel free. <laughs> uh, what, what stands out to you from this episode? So one of the things that stood out for me is the fact that Homer and Marge aren't even in the first act of this episode. Oh. The whole first mm -hmm. act is all at Springfield Elementary. And I found that really interesting on the rewatch because... Mm. Like, you know, we all know where the story is going. It ends with a Homer-Lisa storyline. So the fact that the episode completely bypasses that and doesn't even bring Homer into the story until Act 2, when he's, like, laughing at, like, Mr. Bergstrom crying, like, that's yeah. really interesting that they were able to do that and it still works at the end. No, absolutely. Yeah, I mm. did not even think about that at all. Yeah. Because like, I was thinking, like, because I knew these stories were a bit, you know, water and oil. Like, they mm. didn't really mix together. But, you know, starting out at the school and establishing all this stuff. And I liked how the Bart story, like, bled into the Lisa story. That, yeah, with yeah. Principal Skinner taking charge and doing class. It's just like, uh, I hear laughter upstairs. Something's happening with Bart Simpson. Well, not laughter. Absolute traumatic horror. Disgust. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's something to be said about this episode. If you'd never watched a single episode before, you get it. Mm. straight away you like when it starts off with uh there's chaos in lisa's classroom and she's still reading then you got that transition over to bart and you get it without any pretext yeah yeah they, they sort of merge the two stories together instead of just treating them completely like they even intersperse to each other where lisa's looking at him out the window and everything so it's like this really interesting juggling act of act one they're doing just bart and lisa stuff next together mm -hmm. and then they kind of blend homer into the story and ironically homer doesn't even have anything to do with lisa until really the second half when they go to the museum like he's barely even in mm. her storyline yeah like I, I like how they early they introduce the whole lisa's just flat out ignoring her father at this stage as well when they start up with mm. act two with her and marge having that conversation and she's just trying to remind lisa hey your father your father and i was gonna ask about this because this has always stuck out I, this is my what stuck out to me for better or worse i've never uh -huh. understood this conversation like i get it from a mechanical perspective of this is introducing very early on the distance between lisa and homer but i don't know why marge is just like you know lisa's like oh i had this really good day today yes i had a good day with your father's like what, shut up <laughs> you're centering yourself marge <laughs> yeah, I just, I did, i've never quite got it but I, I mean i understand it from a writing perspective but i don't get it from a character's perspective <laughs> Well, I, I interpreted it as like that she clearly views this as Lisa has like a little crush on the teacher, you know, so mm. I feel like Marge is trying to relate it to one of her crushes, I guess. And since Marge has only really dated Homer, I guess yeah, that's the yeah. only thing she no, can latch on to. What I do take from it is, yeah, she's clearly very excited about this teacher. It's like, well, don't forget, you've got this, you know, father figure, literal father figure at home. You don't need to find one elsewhere. I get, it just doesn't quite land in that sense. I kind of have to make that extra leap to figure out what's going on there. But that's me. Maybe I'm a dumb. But then when they walk up the stairs and she mentions that he cried during Charlotte's Web, like, yeah. immediately Marge is like, I'm trying to show you this is how I Big feel you about your father. And, is, and then yeah. just, bah, ha, ha. Nerdy cried at a book. Oh, Homer. Uh, nerdy sad at bookie walk. Oh, goodness. Uh, what stood out to me, though? Um, uh, the other thing that stood out to me was more asbestos, more asbestos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think that is what sort of stood out to me and I never really noticed is like this discussion of class going on in this mm. episode. Like Lisa mentioning, you know, Bart's appealing the lowest common de denominator and then yeah. Mr. Bergstrom going, oh, you know, you'll miss his antics when you're off to bigger and better things. And mm. then even Homer like fully acknowledging it in his speech at the end where it's like, yeah, you, you'll move on and you'll have special friends and you'll go to fancy events where guys like me are serving drinks. Like, yeah, the awareness of class is just an interesting angle in this episode yeah. to me. Mr. Bergstrom lit literally has a line of, that's the problem with being middle class. Anyone you really care for will move on for someone who needs it uh, more. And it's like, ow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you think, do you think there is, because I don't personally feel this way, but do you think that there is a tinge of elitism in terms of the Lisa storyline, how they're framing that? Like, I feel like 
it reads fine, but there is a little tinge of, you know, her moving on to better things and everybody just being left behind, in a sense. Yeah, I think it's sort of framed in the way to sort of try and make Lisa feel better of her current yeah. state. But, I mean, I guess in that sense as well that, yeah, that could be perceived as a bit... Yeah. You could, but I think it's more, you know, even if she doesn't end up being, you know, President of the United States, uh, she is still going to have different pursuits to her family that's going to alienate her from that, and we do see that eventually. So yeah, I think I think it's that's more the underpinning idea. It's that you're just going to grow up different. Mm. No, definitely. But you know, we're going to talk a lot about the emotions. But how about the wackiness of this episode? What were the cartoony moments? Okay, so I only have one. Uh, the oh. bit where Mr. Bergstrom's singing "Home on the Range" and stopping to correct it. Every time he makes a correction, he he whispers it to one child. <laughs> that is not effective teaching. <laughs> like they, they'd all have to like you know, meet up later and be like, well, what did he say to you? I, said, oh, this is, I don't know. It's, it, it's just <laughs> odd. Why is he doing that? Fair enough. I guess you could say that it's kind of wacky that in his first appearance where he's like, what's wrong with my outfit? That like they knew these things. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Maybe yeah. American teaching, schooling, like maybe my education was bad, but I have no idea when the revolver was invented. And the fact that he... You don't know when Texas became a state? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like the fact that he even brought in a revolver to school, which I hope is fake, I think, um, is kind of kind of crazy. I, I did write down, <laughs> you would not bring a cap gun to school these days. Oh, my. No. Not even Australia, where we don't even have a gun. <laughs> Shouldn't have said that. Now we're vulnerable. Um, this is a knife. <laughs> yeah, because there's not going to be a lot of wackiness to go on about this. But yeah, got to mention, yeah, Dustin Hoffman's performance in this episode. Like, I know cancelled, yeah, but like, this was an amazing performance. And oh, yeah. back in the early days as well, where it's a funny relic where a few of the guest actors were not sure if they wanted to have their names associated with this <laughs> and so james l brooks apparently said well how about we use the pseudonym of sam etic a play uh, on semantic ah uh, nice which yeah. they bring up an odd amount of times i don't know yeah <laughs> yeah a jewish I, cowboy i, I, I did know. write that down i was like is lisa obsessed with the fact that he's jewish because she mentions it twice like his semitic good looks he mentions and i i just yeah. love his facial reaction when she says that yeah. it's so good <laughs> <laughs> but it is an odd little runner with the character mm. i like that the affection for him is absolutely immediate sold by the the score of this episode which yeah if the dialogue don't get you the score will I guess that's sort of what's surprising though about his performance is like for someone who was a bit apprehensive about lending his voice to a cartoon, I mean, mm. oh, as if you would, like this was so authentic. Yeah, I think there's like a good softness to his performance. Like I think he hits those beats like talking to Lisa on her level very well. But I think they do a good job of mixing in some higher energy moments like him going around telling people to say what they're what their talent is and stuff. So mm. I think we do get a really nice range for Hoffman. Yeah. yeah. And even the framing, like all the desks circled around him instead of, you know, the traditional setup. And yeah, what I was going to say is, um, look, Dustin Hoffman's a difficult conversation now, but one thing you can say about his previous work, he always brings his A game. Mm. Uh, even to a role he didn't, wasn't really sure about his A game. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, reference later as well in the itchy and scratchy movie, you know, mm. <laughs> they didn't use their real names, but you could tell it was them. <laughs> Yeah, Lou, I don't have a lot of wacky moments. I guess the Bart election storyline had a lot of wackiness to it, but, I mean, is it that wacky? You know, a cult of yeah. personality that's just like... Not only that, the kids don't know what asbestos is. I remember fearing that you know, line out much, much later in life. Mm. I do love the line of, uh, he says there's no easy answers. I say he's not looking hard enough. Like, okay, that's, that's good. Mm. And even then, just a vote for Bard is a vote for anarchy, and they're both using the same slogan. It's like, yeah, <laughs> ah, yeah, that works. That's, that's so great. Again, they're kids. They want promises like, you know, Coke coming out of the drinking fountain and, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. They don't want anything real, which is what Martin's all about. Was that a reference to idiocracy or something? <laughs> no, there was a reference to Briny Lloyd, who said she wouldn't be able to do that in, uh, like, class prefect when I was in whatever grade I was in. Ah. Weird fucking reference that only people who went to Penitals High will get. Uh, <laughs> what up? And Briny Lloyd, if you're listening, I don't really know who you are. I just remember your name for some reason. That's weird. <laughs> I just I just assumed it was an Aussie reference that I don't get. <laughs> it is, technically, but for 350 people, I'm... Penitals represent! 
<laughs> PH rise up. That's actually kind of a funny joke. Uh, anyway, so how was the emotions of this episode? How was the heart? I didn't feel anything. My heart is shriveled up and tiny. <laughs> no, no, it was it was Damn. obviously tears streaming down my face. I, it's been a while since I've seen this one, and like, yeah, I'm surprised too. that it still got me. I knew where it was going. I could probably yep. recite the entire speech for you right now if I tried. But, but... That, it, it's the details I'd kind of forgotten, like little things, like you know. Homer being like, oh, so I don't have to pay for this museum. I'm not going to. And then Mr. Burke's from doing it because he's like, yeah, I know, but you, you do anyway. Hey, hey, you and... don't have to pay. It's free. Like, oh. This must be your father. Oh, it's ah. just his boorishness is just, oh. I think I really struck the balance with this one. Yeah, I agree. Because, you know, a lot of people would be like, well, I don't have to. So I'm not going to. I'll give you a dollar. That's enough. Like it's a Radiohead album or something. <laughs> uh, and there's even a bit where he's sitting down he's like look you've got a very special girl you need to be a bigger man it's like ow oh there, there's my heart guts yeah then here, Homer not really understanding the point of what Mr. Bergstrom was yeah. after and thinking oh thank you for giving her an A wink wink you know yeah not out of a malicious way just out of not getting it and mm. uh, I think that's what is Homer's saving grace in this it's not that he's you know an absolute jerk ass Homer yet it's just that he doesn't get it they really convey the awkwardness of the whole situation in general. Like, you see all those little, like, Lisa looks that she gives, like, during the do donation mm -hmm. scene and the mummy scene. And, like, it's very well observed how, like, when they're fighting about the mummy, how um, Mr. Burstrom, like, looks back at Homer concerned, you know, and then speaks to him. Mm -hmm. I, I think it, like, that scene could have been done, like, way in a way worse way. And I think the mm -hmm. three-character dynamic is conveyed so well during that whole sequence. Well, yeah, it's just the simple little animation moment of, like, mm -hmm. she's holding his hand, Bergstrom looks down and looks, like, like, it says so much without saying a damn thing. Yeah, and it's their first meeting, and we know from previous interactions where Lisa's all like, oh, you know, so he says, oh, does your father help you with your homework? She's like, no, <laughs> no, dude, no. Unless your next word was burp, you didn't have to keep going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and the fact that then when he meets him, he's like, oh, I kind of get it now. Yeah, it hits. I think they handle the Mr. Bergstrom dynamic in general extremely well. I like I don't mean to go in this direction, but there is the danger of this kind of storyline of the substitute teacher coming off a little weird sometimes and that mm. he's the subject of a crush and you obviously don't want it to come off as why is this teacher giving so much attention to Lisa? Like not in like mm. a sinister way, but it's just kind of weird if he's just giving Lisa all the attention and specifically whereas this episode like he's definitely doing the teacher thing to everybody he's going around all the different students like he's getting lots of face time yeah. with everyone and you get the sense that oh he's just an awesome teacher who just occasionally like talks to lisa you know like on the mm. side and then when they meet up at the museum like he wants to have this conversation with homer i think they handle the mr bergstrom aspect of the character really well and in much worse hands this episode would feel a little weird i think no, absolutely agree. I mean, especially because he invites the entire class to check out the Mis Natural History Museum, but it's only Lisa who shows up, so then naturally he just hangs out with her. That's just what happens. Yeah, true. And I think he sort of has an awareness of the effect he has on women, in a way. Because, yeah, we get, of course, the great reference to the graduate and yeah. Mrs. Robinson with Mrs. Krabappel and... Well, again, he's got that woman at the apartment building as well, where oh. Lisa's like, oh, the train's so like him, environmentally sound and traditional. It's like, yes, and it was been the backbone of our nation. I see he touched you too. Uh. Swoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, amazing. Uh, did it feel like an episode of The Simpsons? Yes. Yes. How's the character integrity? A hundred percent. Yeah, look, I mean, obviously everyone's on point. I think this yeah. is just the best version of Homer you're going to get where, yeah, he's boorish, he's arrogant, you know, because I don't care, it doesn't mean I don't understand. Yeah. Like, to me, that encapsulates what works about uh, Homer's character in an episode where, yeah, you kind of make, need to make him look like the bad guy, but not totally mm. irredeemable. Yeah. 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 And I think something the show will go on to not do is everyone calls him out on it. Like, you know, Marge just says you've got no reason to be upset when your little girl's upstairs crying her eyes out. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think that is something that really doesn't happen later on. Yeah, whenever I watch this episode, I always feel like there's a worst version of this episode out there in yeah. that 
the you are lisa simpson moment is such a showstopper i feel like Mm -hmm. and it always feels like that is the culmination of the episode like if this episode were written in several other ways i feel like that's the big moment that that you sell the episode in but instead we have like this little like add-on to the episode almost like that weird fourth act that the modern episodes have where they bring in like the homer stuff so like it's just amazing how they have two showstopper emotional scenes and they both Mm. work like i think that's really why this episode is so above and beyond other ones that because you know what i mean like i don't know if i'm articulating well i feel like there's a cheaper version of this episode that they could have done and make it all about lisa but instead they bring in that homer lisa relationship and that just elevates it to Mm. just such a higher level yeah yeah absolutely because you have a bank basically you you crescendo and then you've got a little bit more but it's not tacked on it is still the core of this episode it's the fallout of that crescendo and it's yeah it's really really good like i was even surprised on the rewatch i was like oh the end of the second act miss hoover's back okay like holy shit there is still so much more to this thing and like and she uh literally erases mr bergstrom's name which even (laughs) as like an eight-year-old first time watching this i got that symbolism yeah Uh, no absolutely and the wording choice of you are lisa simpson as well like because the note could have said so many trite tacky things as like believe hmm. in yourself or always aim high or some garbage like that but just like you are you like is so yeah. powerful oh do you know the like background story of that note like when they wrote that episode like no. i think originally james o brooks they were pitching on what they should do and james o brooks wrote it down and handed it around to people and it said you are lisa simpson on it but originally he wrote you are lisa simpson with an exclamation point and the <laughs> director of the episode actually like sort of messed it up and put a period instead so he said on the commentary whenever he watches it he thinks oh here's where I messed up the exclamation point, but I think oh. it works way better with a period, to be honest. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's more of a statement, not like a, you're Lisa Simpson! <laughs> like, Yo, yeah, I absolutely agree. It's it's a actual full statement. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. And uh, yeah, way to make a mistake and make the world better. <laughs> but yes or no, would you watch this episode again? Yeah. Yes. Once I've recovered emotionally. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yep. And episodes we want to watch again, we like to think about what playlist they go in. What are some episodes that would pair nicely with this one? I only had one. Uh, I think Lisa is playing uh, The Summer Wind, which plays at the end of the pool episode where Martin's standing naked. Oh, I sure. think. I'm not entirely certain, but it sounds like it. Yeah, sure. I think you could pair this pretty well with, you know, the classic Lisa Homer episodes. I think like Lisa's Pony, I think would go well here. Maybe Lisa's the oh, Gre- yeah. Lisa the Greek from both season three examples. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, big emotional heavy hitters, those ones as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a little bit of Barton Martin rivalry sort of episodes as well. Yep. Like, yeah, they've got an interesting history. Yeah. I, I do think, you know, doing the index, it's sort of a shame that Martin got dropped off as much as he is because he was such a great foil for Bart back in the day and occasional friend. Mm. Yeah. yeah, they have some great episodes together. Oh, elections. How about we throw that in there? There's plenty of elections to go around. The yeah. sanitation commissioner. Sideshow uh, Bob Roberts, yep. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, no episode is perfect. Maybe. BT, what would you like to change about this one? Uh, I mean, you could say more jokes, but I think what's there is so good. I don't want to distract with it with too much comedy. And what's there is it's more subtle comedy. Like I do like Lisa's screaming baboon and then Bart is like... I knew someone was going to say it someday. I just assumed it wouldn't be her. Yeah. Um, yeah, the awareness of Bart in this episode is something that I really enjoy. Like, mm. even him earlier when Homer's, like, excited that he's up for election, and he's like, oh, Dad, come on, it's just a popularity contest. Yeah. And then later when Marge is trying to convince Homer to go to the museum, Bart just being all like, oh, no, Dad, it's okay. You should spend time with Lisa. <laughs> oh, <boy."> yeah. <laughs> But I mean, to that, I also like that Homer's the one that hyped up being class president and is also the one that then calmed it down. There's something really good about that. He, it's the support that Bart needed on every aspect. True, true. Um, yeah, look, it's like, how do you change an icon? I don't know. <laughs> let's, uh, let's change that period to a question mark. You are Lisa Simpson? <laughs> you know what? Interrobang. We'll put it in Interrobang instead. <laughs> okay. What do you reckon, Jim? What would you like to change about this one? 
I honestly can't think of anything, so I'm going to go on a list of extremely, extremely petty things. Yep. So, <laughs> okay, so first of all, uh, so what's up with the kid when he's singing Home on the Range, the really pale, sickly-looking kid? Is that supposed to be mm-hmm. Ralph? Like, I, I know Ralph is in the episode later, but it's just a really weird, like, kid. You know what I mean in that scene? Yeah, yeah the, w- when they hadn't quite figured out all the background children in these things, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I never know if that's supposed to be Ralph or not. It's really weird. In that scene as well, uh, they're eating pemmican. Now, I didn't know this until it was brought up by our friends over at Pods in the Key of Springfield. Like and subscribe. And I'm just reading directly from the Wikipedia. Pemmican is a mixture of tallow, dried meat, and sometimes dried berries. So Hmm. it's like this weird, it looks like a beef patty, but it's like thick, dried fruit meat mix. Wow. I'm somewhat familiar. I was going to ask, has either of you ever eaten some pemmican before? Can't say that I have. I've mm. had a fruit roll up. Is that the same thing? Minus the tallow. I've never even heard of it. Did they actually mention that in the episode? I've seen this so many times, I don't, don't even remember it. Yeah, Mr. Bergstrom says, while well, you're finishing your pemmican. Like, uh. Ah, right. Yeah, at <laughs> yeah. first I was like, did he say pelican? I assume not. I'm just going to move on. <laughs> Also a traditional uh, food of the 1800s. Anyway, sorry, you were saying. Oh, and then my last petty comment is that scene where she's looking out the window at Bart and he's got like the poster. There are some like weird looking kids in that crowd. There's like two Lisas in the background that always, always distracts me. So get rid of the Lisas in that crowd scene. Yep. (laughs) I found something. Yeah? Uh, When Martin is looking at the headline and then turns it over to the camera, it should be upside down and it's not. So either he was looking at it upside down or this is some kind of magic paper. Uh, Either way, I hope someone got fired for that blunder. And yeah, it's always stuck out to me Uh. uh, for some reason. Yeah, that said, it's also a reference to, I want to say Truman... Uh, yeah, where... Dewey defeats Truman, and it's yeah. Truman holding up the paper because he defeated yeah. Dewey. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's a reference to that, you know, Simpsons once again, enjoying their US history. But it always bothered me that he, it doesn't make sense, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, God, what would I change? Yeah, there is something to be said for the lack of comedy in this one, but I think you're right, Peter. It's just, it's more understated, and it's more, it's less lol, and more like... Yeah, it's like my diamond doesn't have enough gold on it. You know? Yeah. And then there's like those jokes that are like, oh, oh, heartbreak. So, yeah, it's hard to know what's like. I do want a little bit of more of Bart's election story, but in the same way, I do feel like maybe because it is just enough. And because, I mean, there's just so much episode in this episode, like, especially for a season two one, that is surprising. Yeah. So, yeah, my changes is not changing much. (laughs) But we are here. Uh, Jim's anything else you want to mention from this episode before we rank it? I love the stuff with Miss Hoover and the Lyme disease. We haven't really talked about Mm. it much, but, like, I will always know what a spiro cheat is because of Ralph (laughs) Wiggum and that line. And then I will always know what the word psychosomatic means because of, like, you know, actually it's a little bit of both. So yeah. that's a great runner. And yeah, more uh, revealing character's full name. I don't know if Elizabeth. I remember this. Yeah, her first name's Elizabeth. And also just on that, I like when she walks in, the kid's like, oh, she got dumped again. Yeah. <laughs> that's a They're good all one. speculating and Lisa's probably the most accurate. And then the uh, the other thing I was going to mention was, um, so I was wondering why you put all three of these episodes together. And I feel like mm. these are the monkey episodes between the first mm. episode and then the second with the monkey's brains. Oh, and yeah. now all the baboon and monkey stuff in this one. So the- a lot of monkey stuff today. Playlist. Oh, you, you, you absolutely guessed it. My totally intentional monkey yep. playlist <laughs> you've won 300 index bucks available to be spent at the gift shop hooray <laughs> that's the appropriate response <laughs> uh how about you bt any other notes uh, we haven't talked about what bart was showing them which was the birth of the of snowball 2 mm. and then makes it go back in uh right when mrs krabop was like children what have i told you about encouraging him and like kind of giving this stern talk and they're all just immediately like hey bart 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 <laughs> he's outside doing something yeah. yeah, he's standing there and he's doing stuff. And um, yeah, just... It's even, like, sort of funny, his, like... Because they clearly didn't coordinate this with Bart. Sherry and Terry were just doing their little yeah. antagonistic thing. Oh, yeah, they were throwing like, him in the deep end, yeah. And he's just like, I'm jumping into it. I was going to give mm-hmm. a speech, but my dog ate it. 
Oh, and then Mrs. Kerbopel were just writing on the note, please keep Bart busy for a few <laughs> minutes. Like, it really yeah. made me wonder when I was little whether teachers actually do that in actuality. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. Oh, yeah. I always knew you had personality. The doctor said it was hyperactivity, but I knew better. <laughs> I just really love, so love, again, it's jerk ass, but it's so funny, of um, when he's trying, Homer's trying to think of a reason not to take Lisa to the museum, and he just goes up to his brain and says, like, oh, you're trapped. If you were smarter, maybe you could think of an excuse, but you're not. <laughs> Ah, that bit's good. Mm. There's a sandwich store at the museum called the Age of Heroes. Like, oh, that's, that's, yeah. Oh, good, good. Yes. And Lisa's excitement when she's all like, oh, can we have him around for dinner? Can we find out his favorite dish and make it? Can I wear jewelry? Can I get my ears pierced? Can I have wine? Just, I don't know. It's so little kid of just a thousand questions because they're so excited. I think it's great. Well, she's even like practicing the questions in the hall later, just like mm -hmm. really highlighting her giddiness over the whole situation. Yeah. And one bit that I only realized later on in life uh, when I grew up was like, what? I remember thinking as a kid, why did, why, how does she know he wouldn't want pork chops? And then later I'm like, oh, he's Jewish. Mm. <laughs> So that's always fun when uh, you learn things from The Simpsons. Yeah, her just the quote of, you know, he didn't even touch my lesson plan. What did he teach you? That life is worth living. Oof. Yep. And just the conclusion of art story that no one votes. It's like, yeah, because you were, ran entirely on fun and personality and no one ever got down to the actual point. Mm. Mr. Bergstrom, he's like, oh, you'll have lots of teachers. Well, none of them is as good as you. No, that's right. I am the best. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a good one to break through the treacle a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Just a little. It's like, yeah, fair. He seems awesome in, in, you know, having completed all my schooling. Look at back at this guy. He's he's clearly good at it. Well, as well, yeah, breaking through the treacle, like Lisa totally pointing out that she's doing the cliche running against the train. Like, Yeah. Um, I was about to say that bit as well hit me. Mm. Oh, yeah. Just Homer just on his line of let's just go to bed. I'm on the biggest roll of my life. It's like, yeah, nice. Mm. No, that was and, all my notes. And yeah, mentioning his speech at the end with Bart as well. Just let that baby have his bottle. Like, I thought this was really important for that story because of how ho mm. much Homer was invested in Bart winning the popularity contest. So Yeah, and just the physicality of it. You know, he picks up Lisa, but uh, Bart, he gives a noogie and then hugs, and it's nice. He's oh. nice. Oh, and like, yeah, Homer just being self-deprecating with the monkey business. Oh, it's, yeah. God damn it. Yeah, El Elliot, why did you bring us such a heartwarming episode on such a hot day? Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm double warm now. Hot, hot day? What are you guys talking about? It's January. Because <laughs> I, I knew for Jim to be cold. So. Do it all for the guest. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I, am, I am so freaking jealous right now. January is the worst. I would gladly take, what would that be, July weather? So... Mm. <laughs> So in the beginning as well, before Mr. Bergstrom comes along, I like the little glimpse of like Principal Skinner actually being a teacher and an educator. Mm. Like, yeah, he instantly knows uh, what Lyme disease is and he explains it in a very concise way. And then yeah. I really wish he uh, went on explaining what the schwa is. But that's also a great contrast of uh, he's all like, <laughs> no, children, you're not seeing things. This is a schwa, which mm. is a good contrast to Mr. Bergstrom's far more engaging education style. I'm really yeah. confused, like, maybe this sounds really stupid, but what is a schwa again? Is it like a Greek alphabet letter? Like, what, what's going on I here? I think. I'm going to give it a Google, but I don't know how to spell it. <laughs> it's in linguistics, blah, 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 blah. Apparently, it's like a short U sound. Yeah, vowel sound in an unstressed syllable. Mm. So it's like in the dictionary, like after like the word, there's like the pronunciation afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I do love those things after because they're just this jumble of letters. Like, how is this helping me pronounce shit? <laughs> uh, and for those of you playing at home, it's S C H W A or upside down E. Yeah, it's the Waluigi of letters. Um. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, it just Mr. Bergstrom's just like undercutting anyone's attempt to make fun of him as well. You got mm. me Mr. Nerdstrom, Mr. Boogerstrom, and it's like, hey, look, the singing dork. Like, oh. <laughs> that was so well done. Like, every time, like, like if I'm ever in a situation where I'm being made fun of, like, I always wish that I could handle, like, how he brushes it mm. off so, in such a charming way, you know? Like, we should all be like Mr. Bergstrom. Yeah. Oh, and I totally stole it for my Tinder profile where my name's Elliot, feel free to make fun of my name, some suggestions are smelly it or peanut butter jelly it. And... It works, ladies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all my notes. It is time to rank this thing. Jim, please kick it off. Well, gosh, I thought about it really hard, you guys, but I think I'm going to have to go cubic zirconia. <laughs> I know that's very shocking, but Hot come take. on. Every I mean, come on. Like, I think this is one of the best Simpsons episodes ever. I think this would go in my top 10 or top 20 at the very least. Like, I haven't looked at it in a while, but it this episode is so good. The heart is there. Like, you could argue that, you know, maybe it could be a little funnier. 
maybe Homer could mm-hmm. be earlier in the episode, but like this is a pretty perfect episode of The Simpsons, so cubic for me. For real. And yeah, I full on agree with you there. It's just you know, there's not many super high ranking episodes for us from season two, but you know, in the handful, yeah, this has just gotta be up there. This is just showing such amazing depth and emotional maturity and Mm. you know bringing it back to the whole yeah dustin hoffman being apprehensive about putting his name to a cartoon this is really demonstrating what the medium can be and that yeah yeah i i could gab on about it for ages and i will but (laughs) bt how about you gab on a bit more (laughs) Yeah, look, I'm going to cubic Zaconia as well. To be entirely fair, there may be a degree of rose-coloured glasses to that. We try as much as we can to not. Even in watching this episode, I was like, now, let's think about this critically. Is this a gold? And part of my brain was just like, no, shut up. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, look, again, it does maybe lack on the jokes, but what the heart is so perfectly well-crafted. I love all the little details that lead the story, that lead the characters. Uh, It's an amazing character piece and just an incredible piece of television. So, yeah, cubic Zaconia from me. All right, unanimous cubic zirconia. This episode gets the Simpsons Index Award for Outstanding Achievement in the Field of Excellence. Woo-hoo! And this will be the fifth episode from season two to get the unanimous cubic. It'll be joining But the Daredevil, One Fish, Two Fish, mm-hmm. Blowfish, Bluefish, The mm-hmm. Way We Was, and Brush With Greatness. Nice. Oh, wow. Yeah. No Bark It's an F? Um, I think I brought the overall rankings of that one down. <laughs> you fool. I got to go on there and change that one too, along with Sky Police. <laughs> <laughs> no, that one got a dull cubic zirconia. There were two cubics and two golds in that one. So, okay. Almost there. But no, that was our last episode of season two to rank as oh, well. Wow. Yeah, this season got an overall ranking of a gold. And yeah, the season highs, the episodes are listed there. And. The lowest episode was a shiny bronze for Bart gets hit by a car, which kind of yeah. left a sour taste in our mouth. Yeah, that's fair. I recall. Yeah, just the stuff with Homer thinking yeah. the relationship was over because... Lost his oh, big yeah. chance at a million dollars. Yeah, I mean, talk about an episode with an add-on that doesn't really work, right? Yeah. But, I mean, otherwise, season two, I think it is a bit unfair that that doesn't... Uh, sometimes gets left out of the conversation of what is yeah. the true classic era of The Simpsons. Like... There's fair enough argument for season one, but there are so many gems in two. This among them. Yes. Uh, excellent. Well, yeah, thank you guys so much for today. That was, yeah, what a wonderful note to leave off after the, the other two. Uh, yeah. Simpsons being done right. Absolutely. And yeah, Jim, if people want to hear more of your stuff and Simpsons content, uh, what, what's happening? What, what are you doing? Okay, so if you don't know already, um, I do a YouTube channel called The Real Gems. It's on YouTube. Terrible channel name. But I just do a bunch of reviews of The Simpsons. I do Simpsons histories, Simpsons mysteries, uh, showdown episodes, Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of lore stuff, as well as I mix in some reviews. Uh, I just did a uh, histories video about Sideshow Mel a little while back, which was really fun. I actually really enjoyed that episode. It was one of those research projects where, where like now I'm kind of a Sideshow Mel fan after looking at all <laughs> his episodes. So, And I'm currently working on a, a review of uh, Some Enchanted Evening. So that will probably be out already by the time you listen to this. So I hope mm-hmm. you enjoyed that review. And yeah, of course, yeah, you deep dives into each season as well. Um, you're still carrying on with that. You're going to go through all the teens eras and beyond. Yep. I, last time I did season 12, so I've said goodbye to Mike Scully now. So it's yep. the long Algene. I'm not going to use the word desert, but uh, it's a really long <laughs> Algene uh, streak we got coming up. So, yep. <laughs> yep. At times a wasteland. But, you know, as we've seen with today's season 30 plus episode, there's good times ahead. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> And BT, if people want to hear more of us. Well, they could listen to Thrones of Game, our Game of Thrones podcast, where we watch the series backwards. Uh, Elliot J. O'Neill has now seen in the entirety of Game of Thrones in reverse order. And uh, yeah, I remember that show very fondly. It's uh, tender to my heart. And our other, other podcast is our audio drama podcast, Pulp Fury Radio, which features all original stories across a range of classic pulp genres like horror, mystery, sci-fi, fantasy, and noir. If you're tired of the ordinary and just hearing white guys talk about TV, and you want a podcast with some thrills and suspense, then check out Pulp Fury Radio, available at pulpfuryradio.com or on all good podcatchers. And if you really, really, really like us, you can go to patreon.com slash sidequeststudios. That's our blanket for everything we do. And you get an exclusive podcast and a few other little fun bits and pieces. 
Yeah, yeah. For five bucks a month, yeah, you get exclusive weekly podcasts. And we've just started a series where we're reviewing the DVD bonus features from, Mm. yeah, the Simpsons DVD box sets. And yeah, so far we've done, like, there was a table read from season 17's The Italian Bob, which we reviewed. So eye-opening. Very illuminating. Like, the table read? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, It's a table read of The Italian Bob. And there's a lot of changed jokes in it as well, including Mm. one where, like, Lisa and Marge are, like, body shaming a bunch of models that... For no reason, either. Wow. (laughs) And the table's just erupting at all the fucking terrible jokes. You're like, so this is how it happens. Interesting. Yeah, the DVD Indextras is what we're calling it. Has been, yeah, Mm. a lot of fun to put together. And yeah, patreon.com slash sidequeststudios. All right, I think that does it for plugs. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, The Real Gems, once again, thank you so much, man. Yeah, really appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me on. I've been listening to your podcast uh, for a while, every, every week at work while I'm uh, while I'm just typing away. So yeah, thanks for having me on, and thanks for letting me uh, look at a Lisa substitute. Uh, uh, I don't know if the audience doesn't know at home, but he basically asked us what episode we want to do, and I said, "Well, I guess that one." And you know, it was really nice yep. of you to let me talk about this episode. So thank you. No, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, no, had a wonderful time today, and yeah, BT, thank you as always. No, hoi hoi. And I've been your host, Elliot J O'Neill. That's all the mustard in the house. And you are Lisa Simpson. (laughs) Cue outro music. (laughs) Thank you for listening to the Simpsons Index podcast, which is also an online spreadsheet available at thesimpsonsindex.com. You can chat to us online at facebook.com slash thesimpsonsindex or at simpsonsindex on Twitter or Instagram. Now there's no bonus scenes for this episode, so we'll catch you next week.